Book your tickets at southernrailway.com. Southern Railway, we're with you of that economic bounce in terms of what it all means for the pound. I mean, we'll keep an eye on that later. Um, but the pound right now, if we take a look at it, um, trading being a bit slow this morning. I hope that's not a sign of anything, Roger. We're absolutely flat. We did see some strength yesterday. 129.11 is where we are on cable. But to the rest of the markets, two and a half minutes into the equity market open, I talked about glass half full in equities. We're seeing green on the screen in Europe. The stock 600 up six tenths of a percent. Regional equity benchmarks also posting gains. The FTSE 100 higher by almost eight tenths of a percent. The CAC 40 higher by six tenths of a percent. FTSE MIB and IBEX in the green just waiting to get an opening print from the DAX. We saw US stocks hit a record yesterday and futures looked like we could build on that with Dow, S&P and Nasdaq futures all higher by at least a quarter of a percentage point. We had no cash trade on the 10-year treasury yield in Asia because Japanese markets were closed. In Asia, though, we did see green on the screen for equities. The 10-year yield is up almost three basis points. We're still just a whisker below the 160 handle, though, but yields are also moving higher in Europe. So risk on is sort of being reflected cross assets today. You're seeing the 10-year bund yield up two and a half basis points at negative 38. The 10-year gilt yield moves higher by two and a half basis points to a 58 handle. In FX, the Aussie has been outperforming. Now, part of that could be down to the risk on when you've got the yen retreating on the other hand. But also, we did have um, some loan data giving a lift to the Aussie. But shorts have been really building up in the Aussie dollar, and it has recently hit a near 11-year low. So that's the broader context. The euro, meanwhile, holding on to six days of losses. And yesterday, we hit a four-month low in that. We're flat today at 109.13. TD Security says the way to play concerns around global growth brought on by coronavirus is to short euro yen. And this is the big question that we're grappling with. Has the market consensus of a global growth rebound for 2020 been put to one side or just put on pause? Taking a quick look at commodities, um, you're seeing oil higher today, WTI 50.05, Brent at 53.79 and gold a little weaker too. Roger. Okay, well, let's have a look at what the stocks are to watch this morning. Bloomberg Stocks Editor Sam Unstead has joined us in our London studio. So Sam, good morning to you. Now, Daimler, they are cutting the dividend and they see um, the higher 2020 profit, however. Yeah, and it would appear that this is uh, actually quite comforting for investors. So their shares have opened higher today. Bear in mind that this is kind of a, a very clear indication of the change that the car industry has to go under. They, they have a massive investment program ahead of them to switch into electric cars. They've cut their dividend in order to conserve cash in order to do that. And that seems to be taken relatively well this morning. Although, bear in mind, this is a company that have issued quite a few profit warnings over the last few years. So I think the fact there is no profit warning today may well be quite nice for investors. Okay. And uh, Tui, now they're bullish on revenue outlook, despite obviously all the problems have been with the Boeing 737 MAX costs. Yeah, it's an extremely complicated release this morning from, from TUI. So they've uh, upgraded their revenue forecast for the year, although first course revenue was slightly below Nine expectations. They have uh, cut okay, their listen, earnings expectations. However, if you take out the Boeing cost, it's actually higher. So it's, uh, it's one that's been uh, poured over by everyone this morning. And overall, I think, despite all the noise around it, it's been taken very well. The shares, in fact, have just opened, and actually they've bounced 9% this morning. So this is being taken very, very well. Also, CEO this morning, uh, quite bullish about any impact from coronavirus. That, for TUI, who have flights and cruise ships, is a pretty comforting yes, statement. Cruise ships, not another good area right now. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, AMS, uh, the chip maker and Apple supplier, uh, they're topping estimates. Yes, indeed, and uh, likely to, to be a nice read across for other chip makers as well. Again, uh, one thing to note here is that they did not really mention coronavirus. There is a big concern at the moment that factory shutdowns and slowdown in China would have a significant impact on the chip making sector. AMS have not really addressed that this morning, but they did beat expectations, and so uh, it's likely their shares are going to open high. We are actually still waiting for an opening price on them, but likely they're going to to move higher, and a lot of other chip makers higher this morning. All right, Sam, thanks so much. Sam Unstead there with Stocks to Watch. Yeah, and speaking of uh, opening prices, I promised I'd bring you one on the DAX. That's higher by eight tenths of a percent, Roger, and actually the two best performing stocks on there uh, right now are Daimler, which we've Mm. just discussed, but also uh, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, poised to win court approval for its takeover of Sprint. This is a according to a person with knowledge of the matter. Uh, but of course, this um, is a huge win for T-Mobile if um, it comes good and its owner, Deutsche Telekom. So we are seeing Deutsche Telekom shares higher there. But let's get back to our top stories. Yes, indeed, because the number of people who've died from the coronavirus in China has reached more than a 1,000 as the province at the centre of the epicentre of the outbreak reported its highest number of fatalities yet. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie reports. China's Hubei province, which remains on lockdown, added 103 more deaths. 
Total infections in China topped 42,700, with the pace of new cases continuing to stabilize. The mortality rate from the coronavirus is now estimated at 1%, according to researchers at Imperial College London. Production is slowly restarting in China after an extended Lunar New Year. Tesla fired up its Shanghai factory and Ford has resumed production. Nissan and VW, though, have said their plants won't be fully operational until next week. In Beijing, I'm Tom McKenzie for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. And the coronavirus will also be top of the agenda for Fed Chair Jerome Powell as lawmakers look to gauge the global economic impact. Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee has this preview of Powell's biannual testimony to Congress. Expect little clarity from the chairman. While there are all sorts of possible scenarios, the virus hasn't gotten into the data yet for either country. Much of the modeling depends on how severe it gets and how long it lasts. Two variables with no answers yet. The possibility of an impact leads to questions about what Fed officials do when the economy finally does face recession. There's little room to cut rates, so what tools would they rely on? And given it's an election year, expect political questions about taxes, budget deficits, and the outlook for the economy. Questions Powell will also try to duck. In Washington, Michael McKee, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Meanwhile, Christine Lagarde speaks at the European Parliament in Strasbourg this afternoon, having reached her first 100 days as ECB president. When it comes to her strategic review, the ECB set out an ambitious timetable, according to Euro area officials, that could see a decision on whether to change the inflation goal by the summer. The review has eight study teams covering themes ranging from the core topic of inflation to modern challenges such as climate change and trade. The UK and the EU are raising the stakes ahead of talks about their new trading relationship. The Chancellor has set out a plan for financial services to diverge from EU rules and a new draft of the EU's negotiating mandate toughens their stance on unfair competition, fishing and human rights. Bloomberg's George Shanker reports. Sajid Javid says he wants a, quote, durable trading relationship for banks, but writing in City AM, he says there will be differences in the UK's rules on financial services. Javid also says he wants a reliable process of equivalence under which regulations on both sides are judged to be adequately aligned. At the same time, the document on which Brussels is basing its negotiating position has been revised now to ratchet up its demands on significant areas, including fishing. Both sides seem to want to start the talks at the beginning of March with the toughest possible stance. In London, George Shanker, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now in corporate news, Alibaba may not be included in the stock program, allowing mainland Chinese investors to buy its shares in Hong Kong anytime soon. People close to the program tell us there are no plans in place to make an exception to rules which exclude companies with secondary listings and weighted voting rights. The rules predate Alibaba's Hong Kong listing, but we're told they may change in the future. Those are your top stories for the latest in global news. Here's Bloomberg's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Naira. Singapore is bracing for a 25 to 30 percent plunge in tourism after the coronavirus outbreak. The city is losing up to 20,000 visitors a day, and that could get even worse if the virus persists. China accounts for about 20 percent of Singapore's tourism. The tourism board CEO Keith Tan says the sector is calling for help. The main cry that I'm hearing is help right now from the entire tourism industry. Uh, There's lots of anecdotal evidence of business drying up, but that's not surprising given how how much China uh, contributes to our visitor arrivals. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to push ahead with the HS2 high-speed rail project linking London to northern England. That comes despite political opposition and a spiralling cost. The new route will be the UK's biggest ever infrastructure project and currently Europe's largest. But the price tag could reach more than £100 billion and the first trains may not start running until 2031. Staying in Europe, German Chancellor Angela Merkel will take an active role in choosing her next Saxon. Successor. That's after her heir apparent, Annegret Kram karrenbauer decided to step down and not run for the chancellorship. She confirmed her decision during a speech at the CDU's headquarters. Ich werde mich nicht um eine Kanzlerkandidatur I will not run as a chancellor candidate. Just as I have announced this, I am leading the process to come to a chancellor candidate for the CDU, the union. 
AKK, she's known, was unable to stamp her authority on the party. The final straw was last week when a local chapter of the CDU defied her orders and voted alongside the far right. And in the US, President Trump has released his annual budget. He's proposing deep cuts to social programs, but increases in defense and entitlement spending. The move would push the gross federal debt above $30 trillion. That's over the next decade. The budget is more a list of policy aspirations. It is no binding power as federal Federal spending is decided by Congress. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Roger. Leanne, thank you. Now we're going to get the morning sport with William Ezra. And William begins with Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta's comments. Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta says the Premier League's winter break has come at the perfect time. He's taken a squad to Dubai for some warm weather training ahead of their next match with Newcastle on Sunday. Arteta took over as manager in mid-December and feels he needed the extra time with the players. For us it's very useful. We haven't had time to work together 20 or 24 players for more than four days since I joined because we had so many games. So we needed a bit of getaway, put things in place and train, you know, so I think it's going to be useful. Brentford boss Thomas Frank thinks Leeds are scared about visiting Griffin Park this evening. The two sides meet in the Championship and a win for the London side would move them above the Orchard Club. Brentford could go second with the win, but Nottingham Forest could also move into the top two with a win at home to Charlton. And just one race meeting has survived the weather today. There are eight races at Newcastle as part of their all-weather championships. Air and Lingfield have been cancelled due to waterlogged tracks. That's your European sport. Now, coming up on Daybreak Europe, we'll go live to Beijing for the latest on the coronavirus as deaths top 1,000, but the infection rate seems to be stabilizing. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Asset managers who sees change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, president of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, we understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best-in-class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at seic.com slash seize change. In today's volatile markets, investors need resilient portfolios to help handle the pressure. Through decades of expansions and recessions and changing interest rates, clients have turned to PIMCO to help them stay on course, no matter what course markets take. PIMCO, active fixed income solutions that aim to give investors an edge. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Investing in the bond market is subject to risks. Consult your investment professional prior to making an investment decision. Open calendar. What's my schedule looking like? Next Thursday, you will be caught in an emergency flash flood between Park and First Street. What? No. No, that doesn't work. I'm, I'm busy then. Decline. De- decline. Floods don't exactly work around your schedule. Disasters don't plan ahead. But you can. It starts with talking to your loved ones about making an emergency plan. So don't wait. Communicate. Get started today at ready.gov slash plan. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. Here's Francine Lacroix. Joining us, actually, is Fiona Frick from Unigestion. Fiona, when you look at uh, the coronavirus, how do you view it from a market perspective? It's interesting because macro news were, were quite good. Central bank have shown that they are there. It can be the U.S. Central Bank, the European Central Bank, or even the China Central Bank, and inflation is nowhere. So on an economical front, if you look, it's quite good, but the problem is it's backward looking. And then there you have this uh, coronavirus, which has two impacts, first on demand on China, China, which could have an influence on global demand and therefore on global growth and uh, therefore to, also output. But to a point where actually we could hear, we could see the, the seeds of a possible recession, Fiona, or, or not so much? So is it slowing growth? For the moment, we see slowing growth. And the problem is with the coronavirus and, and it's... So, and with the response that China has done, which is incredibly powerful of quarantine all these people, uh, the impact it can have on consumption uh, 
and on output for some global companies can be quite important. So the question is, how long will it last? And uh, so it's more of a wild card today for us that we are looking at, but we keep our positioning, which is still positive on the macro side because growth is still there in the U.S., not brilliant in Europe, uh, no inflation and academic central banks, which will be ready to step in if there is a problem. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Roger Hearing. Time for a Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. Now over to the first word breaking news desk in Berlin for today's morning call with Richard Jones. Richard, good morning. Good morning, Roger. It's been a broad-based rally for equity markets in Asia today. The Shanghai Composite traded higher by four-tenths of one percent, with the CSI 300 closing higher by nine-tenths. The Kospi traded higher by one percent, the Hang Seng higher by one and a quarter percent, while Japanese markets were closed for a public holiday. The E-mini S&P and E-mini Nasdaq futures are also both trading higher, up by three-tenths and four-tenths of one percent, respectively. European equities have had quite a buoyant open this morning, with the Eurostoxx 50 and CAC Front trading higher by seven-tenths of one percent, with the DAX and FTSE 100 outperforming, both trading up by nine-tenths of one percent. Turning to the bond markets, the U.S. 10-year yield is two basis points higher at 1.59%, while the 10-year German bond yield is also trading two basis points higher at minus 0.39%. In the FX space, the Bloomberg dollar index is a little changed, with the Australian dollar the standout performer among G10 currencies, up four-tenths of one percent versus the greenback on the broadly positive risk sentiment. In terms of European economic data today, we get several releases from the U.K., including the preliminary fourth quarter GDP reading, industrial and manufacturing production for December, in addition to trade data for December. In terms of central banks, there are several speakers this afternoon, including Lagarde, Schnabel and Lane from the ECB, in addition to Carney and Haskell from the Bank of England. That's it for me. For more macro breaking news, it's SQUA Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. Roger. Thanks, Richard. Now, that's the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans with more on what's going on around the world. Roger, thank you. BlackRock has promised to put climate change concerns at the centre of its investment strategy. But that didn't stop activists from storming its Paris office yesterday. Protesters barricaded the premises, spraying red paint on the floors and covering walls in graffiti. The firm has seen protests in other cities over the past a few years. Turkey says it's carried out a sweeping retaliation for a deadly attack on its troops in Syria. It hit over 100 targets and officials estimate they may have killed scores of pro-Assad forces. The response came after pro-government forces killed five Turkish soldiers in the northwest province of Idlib. And finally, Copenhagen in Denmark and Bern in Switzerland have been jointly named the most livable cities in the world. The annual study for workers considering relocating looks at factors like housing, infrastructure and health services. The highest ranked UK city was Edinburgh, joint 19th while London was in joint 47th spot with Belfast. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Neira. Leanne, thank you. I've got to say, I love Copenhagen and I love Edinburgh. So that has got mm. me thinking. You've been thank to you. Bern? I have not. But I Googled <laughs> Bern and it looks absolutely stunning. I, I passed fantastic. through there once and for the few minutes I was there, it was lovely. Wow. <laughs> but thank- I agreed with Neira, Copenhagen is beautiful. Thank you, Leanne Gerrans, for instigating a clear out of the studio in future <laughs> with the world news. Now, let's get back to coronavirus. More than a thousand people have now died from the coronavirus as the Chinese province at the epicentre of the outbreak reported its highest number of fatalities yet. Hubei province has also removed two health officials from their posts amid criticism over the handling of the epidemic. For more, let's go live to Beijing, where Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie is standing by. Tom, great to have you with us. Um, Markets seem to have seized on the prospect of a potential stabilisation of the infection rate. What do we know about that? Well, according to the data that we're getting out of China, which is passed on, of course, to the World Health Organization, the numbers of infections that are being reported have actually reduced again. So it looks like we're not at the point yet where any experts are saying it's starting to peak. But if this trend continues of falling infection rates on a daily basis, then clearly that's a positive. The other piece of information that came out, and this was from Imperial College London, was according to their assessment, they've been crunching the data, the mortality rate is closer to 1%, so a little bit lower than some estimates. And something, obviously, we're very focused on here in Beijing. It's expected to be higher in Hubei, which is the epicenter. So you're right to say that the number of deaths, unfortunately, keep ticking up. 103 
three deaths just out of the province of Hubei, taking the total to above 1,000. And in terms of total infections, more than 42,000 now, closing on to 43,000. Of course, we're getting more cases in this region as well and globally. And, and, of course, some concern that we may not, in fact, have the full data quite yet. But, but Tom, um, what about businesses restarting? We've heard that Ford and Tesla both reopening factories or planning to do so. Uh, are, is China getting back to work in any way? Well, this is the second day of people essentially are meant to be getting back to work. It's the second day after that extension of the Lunar New Year holiday where the working day is back. But it's not full force. I've been out on the streets and it's very quiet still. A lot of white-collar workers working from home, blue-collar workers still out there keeping the city running. And this is happening across China, of course. I've been speaking to some companies like Huawei, like Meituan, the e-commerce company. They say that a lot of their workers are still working from home. They don't expect their workforce to be at full capacity until next week at the earliest. You talked about the auto sector. That, of course, is an important part of the economy here. It makes up about 5% of China's GDP. So Tesla and Ford, yes, their factories are back up and running. VW, though, Volkswagen and Nissan say they're probably going to wait until next week before starting full production again. It's about getting workers into their factories, but it's also about that supply chain disruption. On the real estate sector, by the way, home sales dropping 90% in the first week of February. So that gives us some indication as to the pressure that the developers here will be undergoing forward as well. Um, Tom, speaking of pressure, Xi Jinping uh, made his first public appearance visiting the Chaoyang district in Beijing on Monday afternoon. How much political pressure is China's leadership under? They're under more political pressure than they have been for many years. And this was really sparked by the death of this whistleblower doctor who, of course, came out in December, warned some of his colleagues about this, and very unfortunately caught the disease and then died. He was shut down by the police. He was reprimanded by officials. So his death did spark a significant amount of anger. It's not just that. It's the quarantining of 60 million people in the province of Hubei that is causing, of course, a lot of anger as well. So the politicians now, President Xi in particular, is trying to rewrite or take charge of the narrative again, because essentially the party lost control of that narrative for about a week. It's the first time we've seen him out in public for at least a week. He was in the district where I live, meeting with medical officials and some local residents. He's had Premier Li Keqiang. He's been down there to Wuhan. Premier President Xi Jinping hasn't himself, but they have now fired a couple of top health officials in Hubei. Again, they're trying to reclaim the narrative here because there is that anger. It remains. Does it really essentially challenge President Xi and his coterie of people around him? Not at this point, but it's certainly a stress, a fracture uh, in that relationship between the people of China and the Communist Party. All right, Tom, thanks very much. Tom McKenzie there live on the line from Beijing with the latest on the virus. And speaking of what's happening in markets, 25 minutes into the equity market open here, we did see quite a bit of green on the screen in Asia, even with Japan closed. The stock 600 in Europe is up eight tenths of a percent. We're seeing the risk on reflected cross assets. The Aussie dollar is bid. We're seeing the yen retreat. Uh, we're also seeing yields move higher. The 10-year treasury yield still below 160, but up one and a half basis points to a 159 handle. The 10-year bond yield moves higher by two basis points and u.s futures point to more gains after records yesterday this is bloomberg this is a bloomberg money minute the merger of sprint and t-mobile appears to be a go sources say a federal judge will rule in favor of the deal in a lawsuit brought by several state attorneys general to block it the decision could be made public today stocks are back at record highs as wall street set aside its coronavirus fears fed chair jay powell will be on capitol hill today for the first of two days of testimony but he may be as much in the dark about the virus as the rest of us, according to Citigroup strategist Tobias Levkovich. Just something that's way up in the air. So it's going to be kind of standard, you know, status quo. We're, we're on the lookout. But I don't think he has any more insight to this than you and I do. The Fed called the coronavirus a new risk to the economic outlook in a report to Congress released last week. The virus is making itself felt even on the golf course. Callaway Golf says it lost more money last quarter than it did a year earlier. And it says the epidemic will hit sales in Asia this quarter. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. The Bloomberg Business of Sports podcast. How did the Yankees become this mega valuable team? Where the money is flowing inside sports around the globe. From the marketing perspective, where are the dollars spent? From union heads to team owners, Scott Soshnick and Michael Barr speak to the names that power this multi-billion dollar industry. Boston Red Sox CEO Sam Kennedy. National Hockey League Commissioner Gary Bettman. Bloomberg Business of Sports. Listen today on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. 
Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stone? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit? It's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is, your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high, get a DUI. Paid for by... Finding your perfect new home can be tough. So if you keep missing out... It's time to search out... There are thousands of new properties to buy or rent every month at onthemarket.com. 24 hours or more before they're on Rightmove or Zoopla. See them first. Set up a property alert today. Search on the market.com to find your perfect home. If you're in the market, search on the market.com. See on the market.com forward slash new and exclusive. Agents specify exclusivity. Vodafone 5G will have the power to change your world. From driverless cars to virtual reality and real time gaming. That's why we're rolling out 5G in London and across the UK. Discover Vodafone 5G on the UK's best mobile data network. The future's exciting. Ready? Vodafone. NPERF testing awarded Vodafone Best 2019 Mobile Internet Performance based on 35,664 tests on the NPERF app in the UK. Coverage may vary. Visit vodafone.co.uk. It was a Sunday morning when I jumped on the tube. And decided to pop down to Greenwich via... A large indoor jungle. And when I got there, I was captivated by a sparkling... Scary dinosaur just standing there right in front of me. So off we went to Wembley Park... To look at the colourful fish... Tap into the wonderful world of off-peak London. Travel in zones 2 to 6 for £1.50. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. £1.50 is an adult off-peak page to go fare for a journey not going via zone 1 on tube, DLR and most London overground services. Always touch in and out with the same card or device to pay the right fare. What do you do to be an everyday superhero, like Mary? So I know it's tempting to pour used cooking oil straight down the sink, but I spoke to the local council and they said the best way to get rid of oil or fat is to collect it, once it's cooled down, of course, in a used container. And then you can scoop it out and put it in the bin. Cooking oils and fats block thousands of pipes every year. Save our sewers, rivers and seas by putting them in the bin where they belong. Visit thameswater.co.uk forward slash bin it. Together, we can care for the environment. Send message to Elise. Salut. Sorry, I'm running late. Just in the car now. Send. Ah, I forgot the cake. Send. Actually, great news. Satnav has found a new route. See you in 10. Message on the move in the Citroen C1 and stay connected. Experience Citroen C1. Available from £149 per month with initial rental of £149. Citroen drive responsibly. Citroen UK Limited is a credit broker, not a lender. Personal lease. You will not own the vehicle. Offer on field VTI 72.5 speed manual. 6,000 miles per annum. Guarantee may be required. Terms, eligibility criteria and return conditions apply. PSA Finance UK Limited. Broadcasting live to London on DAB Digital Radio. To New York, Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 99.1. To Boston, Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco, Bloomberg 960. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. 8.30am in London, 9.30 if you're listening in Paris, Frankfurt or Brussels. Good morning everyone, I'm Neira Chahit. And I'm Roger Hearing and you're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. 30 minutes into the equity market open here in Europe. We've got some conviction in terms of risk on the stock 600 up almost 8 tenths of a percent. Every industry group in the green led by travel and leisure, commodity producers and car makers. On regional equity benchmarks, a lot of green on the screen. The FTSE 100 up more than 1%. The DAX higher by almost 1%. The CAC 40 trends higher by about 6 tenths of a percent. Same for the FTSE MIB and the IBEX up four tenths of a percent. We saw the S&P 500 hit a record yesterday and futures looked like we could build on those gains. Dow, S&P and Nasdaq futures all higher by at least two tenths of a percent. And it's fairly broad risk on we're seeing across assets. The 10-year Treasury yield cash trading started in London. We're up almost two basis points. Still below a 160 handle at 159. The 10-year Bund yield up two basis points, negative 39. The 10-year gilt yield moves higher by two basis points as well. In FX, 
The Aussie dollar is leading gains in G10. Part of that was down to loans data, but also the general broad risk on, although the market has been building up shorts in the Aussie as it recently also hit near an 11-year low. The yen retreating somewhat. We saw the euro uh, see six days of declines and hit a four-month low in yesterday's session. We hold on to that low right now, 109.08 on euro dollar. In commodities, uh, oil is on the front foot, WTI and Brent both up more than 1%. So extending gains from earlier, WTI trading at 50 spot, $13 a barrel, Brent at 53.95, bouncing back from a one-year low and gold retreating slightly down a quarter of a percentage point, Roger. Right, let's catch up with our top stories. Now, the number of people who've died from coronavirus in China has reached more than 1,000 amid a surge in fatalities in the Chinese province at the epicenter of the outbreak. Bloomberg's Brian Curtis has more from Hong Kong. 2,097 new infections, but the smallest increase since February 1st. That stoked a big rally in stocks as investors clamor for a peak in infections. Also, state media said Hubei removed two officials, including the party chief. That goes to accountability. But a worrisome development here in Hong Kong. Two infections in the same apartment, some 10 floors apart. That raises fears about the mode of infection. And more than 100 people were evacuated. In Hong Kong, Brian Curtis, Bloomberg, Day break Europe. Meanwhile, Intel has joined a list of major tech companies bailing on the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona later this month. Intel said it's withdrawn from the world's biggest mobile tech exhibition out of a, quote, abundance of caution over the coronavirus outbreak. Ericsson, Sony and NVIDIA are among the other big exhibitors who have elected to not attend MWC to avoid health risks to employees. The UK government says it'll break away from EU rules governing financial services, but it still wants a durable relationship. The Chancellor Sajid Javid says the UK may choose to do things the same way as the single market, but there will be differences as the City of London must match international standards. Meanwhile, the EU is ratcheting up its demands ahead of post-Brexit trade talks with the UK. The move risks inflaming tensions with Downing Street. The bloc wants stricter terms on unfair competition, fishing and human rights. And controversially, the EU wants to force the UK to continue to abide by its rules in areas such as state aid. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has already dismissed some of the demands. And Daimler shares are up this morning after the company said it expects earnings before interest and taxes for this year to grow significantly compared to 2019. The turnaround effort comes after three profit warnings since May last year when the CEO Ola Kalenius took over at the carmaker. Yeah, there was a number of things um, to sort of go through in these earnings. I mean, crucially as well, Daimler cutting its dividend to the lowest since the financial crisis. That was something that the market was looking to, to get an update on that. But then at the same time, also promising deeper cost cuts. Um, the CEO, um, Ola Kalenia, is trying to free up cash to pay for an accelerated electrification effort in the coming year. It's this e-car shift, which is uh, really taking a lot of focus. And Daimler really looking to sort of turn around from this year to despite headwinds. Yeah, because the e-car thing, I think, is something that's really in the minds of almost all automakers. It must surely be. And particularly, I think, the German area at the moment, where they're really considering this in a big way and trying to make sure they can actually get something uh, out of that that's going to work for them. Well, in fact, we can now talk to uh, Matt Miller, who is live on the line from Stuttgart. Uh, now, Matt, you've been speaking, or you will be speaking, I think, to Ola Kalenius, the CEO, later today. How should we read these results? Because in some ways, they were perhaps not as bad as some people had feared. Right. Well, I think the market was happy to see that the earnings before interest in taxes um, forecast was higher than uh, last year. On the other hand, the unit sales are expected to drop compared to last year. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, the, the, the dividend cut was a deeper cut than Bloomberg had been forecasting, but that may be good news because they need that money, of course, to work in electric cars. And I heard Nero say they're planning other uh, or deeper cost cuts, which is also true. They had previously said, well, they previously said they were going to cut about 1.4 billion euros by the end of 2022. And now they're saying they're going to cut more than 1.4 billion euros by the end of 2022. We're not mm. sure yet on the uh, job headcount number, but we know it's going to be 10,000 or more. Yeah, and it's interesting um, with what you were saying about the dividend, Matt. I suppose you could argue that frees up the cash to pay for that um, uh, quicker electrification um, effort. In terms of the cost cutting, this is one of the things um, that uh, the new CEO has really been focusing on. And there were reports ahead of this from Handelsblatt that we could see 15,000 job cuts. Are we likely to get any numbers put on this beyond today? I imagine um, that you'll be pushing on that in the interview. 
Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll be asking him. I'm going to speak to him in just about three hours' time from now for some specific numbers. It doesn't look like, since he didn't give them in a release, I'm I'm doubting that he's going to want to give me specific headcount cut numbers. But I, I think that's because they're trying to do it in a more flexible way. So it's not just about reducing their 304,000 strong workforce by 10,000 or 15,000. They're also going to try and get some people to expect or to accept part-time work. They're going to get some people to accept moving their retirement forward. So um, they're going to try and do it. It looks like in a, in a more humane way, which, um, of course, the, the unions that are so strong in this country would, would demand as well. Is there a sense, really, Matt, that, that, that this is a company that has actually got a handle on how to handle the, the, the huge headwinds that are blowing at the moment, not least, of course, from China in all this? Um, there is a sense. There is a sense of concern about, obviously, the Chinese situation because Daimler has put such a big bet. Daimler and BMW have put bigger bets on Chinese production than, say, Volkswagen. Um, they get about a third of their profit from uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, from, from their Chinese joint venture, so that's a huge concern. The diesel issue, Roger, that you that you bring up or that you brought up with me earlier, is also a big concern. In that, Daimler hasn't just sort of accepted his punishment and moved on. Moved on. They're fighting um, the charges of engine manipulation in court, and that is ending up ending up costing them a lot of money. So while yeah. other companies have just paid the fine and moved forward, they're not able to. Matt, we've literally got 20 seconds, but what do we know about the impact specifically of coronavirus on Daimler? We don't know anything yet, and that's the first question I'm going to ask all the colonials. I love it. Thank you so much. Bloomberg's Matt Miller joining us from Stuttgart. And he, of course, will be speaking to the CEO of Daimler, Ola Kalenius, later today. Of course. Now, we were talking about the coronavirus and effect potentially there. Now, let's bring in uh, our very own Leanne Gerrans with Global News and starting off with some of that effect in Singapore. Yes. Good morning, Roger. So, Singapore is bracing for a 25 to 30 percent plunge in tourism after the coronavirus outbreak. The city is losing up to 20,000 visitors a day, and that could get even worse if the virus persists. That's a bigger impact than the 2003 SARS pandemic. China accounts for about 20% of Singapore's tourism. Let's cross over to Europe, where Chancellor Angela Merkel will take an active role in choosing her next successor. That's after her heir apparent, Anna Gretkram Karrenbauer, decided to step down and not run for the chancellorship. AKK, she's known, was unable to stamp her authority on the party. The final straw was last week when a local chapter of the CDU defied her orders and voted alongside the far right. Staying in Europe, Ireland's main political parties face weeks of talks to form a government after Saturday's general election. Bloomberg's Peter Flanagan has all the details. Main opposition party Fianna Fáil is projected to be the biggest party, while Sinn Féin is likely to finish second. Yet both are well short of the 80 seats needed for a majority, and the coalition of Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin and the Green Party is most likely according to betting odds. While Fianna Fáil leader Michal Martin vowed not to work with Sinn Féin before the vote, he has since softened his tone. In Dublin, Peter Flanagan, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. And the U.S. has charged four mem members of the Chinese army for the 2017 hack of consumer credit agency Equifax. <laughs> Attorney General William Barr says the ruling is a reminder to China that the U.S. has the ability to track down hackers and to prosecute them. The breach exposed the personal information of almost 150 million Americans. Equifax CEO Mark Beager told us that the charges are a significant step forward for the data industry. The fact that the attackers um, were a, a military arm of a foreign government really raises the stakes and raises the bar for all of us. And as Attorney General Barr pointed out, it's not just Equifax, they've attacked multiple companies. That was Equifax's CEO speaking to Bloomberg there yesterday. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find 
free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Family properties and investments have been passed to the next generation. But while the business has evolved, has your accountant stayed behind? Burden Accountants and Advisors examines the latest business trends, market conditions, and industry issues to maximize your tax advantages and meet your financial goals. Let Burden use their insight to create innovative tax solutions for your family and your business. Visit BurdenLLP.com to get started. B-E-R-D-O-N-L-L-P.com. Burden Accountants and Advisors. We listen. We solve. We do. Why do hedge funds and other alternative managers rely on Pershing for a highly personalized experience? Mark Alderati, a managing director at BNY Mellon's Pershing and head of Prime Services, explains. In today's fast-paced environment, where the only constants are change and volatility, you need a prime broker who's both steady and agile, focused on supporting your needs so that you can focus on growing your business and producing results. Exceptional client service and advocating for our clients is at the core of what we do. Our award-winning high-touch team is just one of the benefits of working with BNY Mellon. We help alternative investment managers create great experiences for their clients. Whether it's customized financing, securities lending solutions, platform access, or outsourced trading, BNY Mellon's Pershing is a prime broker who's committed to this business and dedicated to meeting your evolving demands. To learn more about the unique and industry-leading solutions for hedge funds and other alternative managers, visit Pershing.com. Pershing, LLC. Member FINRA, NYSE, SIPC. Message and data rates may apply. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, work from home on a Friday jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, Soho jobs, Shoreditch jobs, keep me away from the central line jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, never ever boring jobs, small jobs, big jobs, lunch in borough market jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. It was a Sunday morning when I jumped on the tube and decided to pop down to Greenwich via a large indoor jungle and when I got there I was captivated by a sparkling scary dinosaur just standing there right in front of me so off we went to Wembley Park to look at the colourful fish tap into the wonderful world of off-peak London travel in zones 2 to 6 for £1.50 to the Mayor of London and TfL every journey matters £1.50 is an adult off-peak page you go fare for a journey not going via Zone 1 on Tube, DLR and most London overground services. Always touch in and out with the same card or device to pay the right fare. The Mona Lisa is only 30 inches tall. The world's hottest chilli, 1 inch. And Napoleon, taller than a Great Dane, but only by 71 centimetres. Who says small can't make an impact? The Peugeot 108 Allure is now available for just 159 per month with 159 initial rental. Our small but mighty car that doesn't have to cost you a small fortune. Peugeot Motor Company PLC, a credit broker not a lender, will introduce you to PSA Finance UK Limited. Personal finance lease, 48 months at 159, 18 plus, guarantee may be required. Terms of eligibility and return conditions apply. You will not own the car. Good morning, this is your southern service to London, Victoria. Join in our onboard quiz. Here's our next clue. What C sounds like a handheld party food but keeps you dry and protected from the rain? Not canapes, canopies. At Southern Railway, we're investing over £7 million into making improvements for you, like canopies, cycle parking and new platform lighting across more of our stations. Find out more and book your tickets at southernrailway.com. Southern Railway. We're with you. Dribbles with the right hand. Now he attacks. Dribbles with the left hand. Drives, goes up off the glass, breaks it in! The 2020 NBA All-Star Game is live on TuneIn Premium. Stop with the right hand! Because this thing is over! Catch every fast break, fadeaway, and alley-oop as Team LeBron and Team Giannis go head-to-head in Chicago. Which star will shine the brightest? Who will be named this year's MVP? Find out Sunday at 8 Eastern with ESPN Radio's live coverage of the NBA All-Star Game on TuneIn. Search premium to upgrade today. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. 
You love tuning for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Roger Hearing with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. Now, stocks have been climbing in Europe, catching the risk on mood that we saw earlier in Asia, apart from obviously in Japan, which was on a holiday. But now we're seeing it right across the Eurostock 600, up six tenths of 1%. We're seeing uh, particularly the automakers and miners doing well there. FTSE 100 up nine tenths of one percent. CAC uh, fifth five uh, half of one percent, I should say. DAX up eight tenths of one percent, and the IBEX up two tenths of one percent. We're seeing a lot of risk on sentiment. It, will that spread across to the US? Where, of course, we saw the S and P 500 hit a record high on Monday. Well, S and P futures up tenth of one percent. Dow up. Two tenths of one percent. Nasdaq up three tenths of one percent. So that's modest uh, optimism staying there right now. We're looking across to uh, the bond market. Now it was delayed somewhat because, of course, Japanese opening were closed today. So therefore, the bond trading didn't open until uh, here in Europe uh, at seven o'clock. Ten-year uh, Treasury is currently one point five eight. Is the handle that's up uh, a tenth, uh, ten, uh, sorry, one basis point. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the bunts uh, there. It's up another basis point, uh, negative zero point three. Three right now. Also keeping an eye on cable, which is at 1.29. Oil, interesting, sticking just above 50. 50.15 is where we find WTI. Brent crude, 53.99. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here's Len Garrison with more on what's going on around the world. Roger, thank you. Let's start here in the UK, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to push ahead with his HS2 high-speed rail project linking London to Northern England. That comes despite political opposition and spiralling costs. The new Route will be the UK's biggest ever infrastructure project and currently Europe's largest, but the price tag could reach more than £100 billion and the first trains may not start running until 2031. BlackRock has promised to put climate change concerns at the centre of its investment strategy, but that didn't stop activists from storming its Paris office yesterday. Protesters barricaded the premises, spraying red paint on the floors and covering walls with graffiti. The firm has seen protests in other cities over the past few years. And finally, on this day in history, in 1929, the Vatican signed a pact with Mussolini's Italian government to become the world's smallest independent nation state. The treaty put an end to a long dispute between popes and Italy following unification. Vatican City covers 109 acres but has its own postal service, radio station and banking system. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists, some analysts and more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Naira. Leanne, thank you so much. Leanne Gerrans with the World News. Now, let's get back to our top story. And of course, we are seeing quite a bit of risk on across markets today, even as the coronavirus death toll rises. But investors perhaps seizing on signs that there could be some stabilization in the infection rate. Jiro Young, Chief Economist at Mirabeau Asset Management, joining us now live from Geneva. Uh, Jiro, great to have you with us. Are you getting a sense now that despite the risk on we're seeing today, the consensus view of a global growth rebound for 2020 is being because seriously called today, into question because of coronavirus? Rises, but investors perhaps well, it's an important topic, of course. Uh, now, I think, uh, we think uh, what is important this, whether the cases outside Hubei province are stabilizing or not, or not. And this seems to be the case because no new cases outside the Hubei provinces, province um, are concerned. And this is something encouraging, pointing in the direction that the outbreak of the virus is stabilizing. But what about the scale of the impact? I mean, obviously, it's early to tell. But looking widely, we're getting some suggestions that uh, the full-year economic growth rate in China could drop by as much as one percentage point in 2020. That's according to a senior member of a government think tank there. Do you, is it as bad as that? Could it be worse? So 
Sure, that's certainly a possibility. Um, from an economics point of view, I think what matters is whether this is uh, temporary or more permanent. And the SARS outbreak in 2003, for instance, showed us that uh, the uh, virus outbreak then was something temporary, was Chinese GDP falling from basically 11 to 5% in Q2 in 2003, and then rebounding back to about 15% in Q3. We think in our baseline scenario is that the current virus outbreak will be similar, so some Thing of temporary nature only. Does that mean that what you are modeling for and um, integrating into your um, asset allocation decisions is a V-shaped rather than a U-shaped or L-shaped recovery, Giro? Correct. It's a V-shaped um, recovery scenario. And our baseline scenario includes that uh, new cases uh, of this virus uh, will be stopped by the end of March. What then about the wider implications of this? Because one of the one of the themes that's been around on the Bloomberg Terminal uh, today has been uh, American exceptionalism, the idea that perhaps America doesn't get that much affected by this, or perhaps it does. It had been a, on our MRM Live uh, blog, we've been talking about that as a theme. Uh, but do you see perhaps U.S. equities and bonds gaining now, perhaps because people don't see them as affected as some other areas? Well, we will see the new surveys and MDD Philly survey that will give us some hints about the, the impact. Um, when we look at uh, concrete data, the impact on U.S. growth, if we take, for example, the elasticity of U.S. exports, U.S. exports to uh, the changes in GDP in China, a 10% decline in U.S. exports to China, which represent about $18 billion, which set off about 0.1% of nominal GDP and about 0.4 percentage points of GDP growth in the U.S. Um, now, if we take the data last year, for instance, since China's uh, tourists spend about $20 billion in the U.S., it's unlikely that these $20 billion would go down to zero. So overall, the effects on U.S. growth are likely to be very limited, and this is also what we think and what we include into our baseline scenario. Um, what are you expecting to hear from Jerome Powell in relation to this then? Because there's a very fine line that he needs to tread. He has to obviously acknowledge coronavirus, um, but perhaps without giving signals either way, what do you think, how do you think he should handle this? Sure, we think um, we do not expect the main uh, surprises at his testimony today. Uh, refer um, to the statement, the FOMC statement, uh, the press release that um, happened in, in the end of uh, end of January, which was very dovish, uh, which with the Fed namely arguing that they want a return to an inflation objective of two percent, whereas before they were more much more vague, stating that uh, inflation near the two percent um, is there is there goal. So this uh, change of words returning to the 2% of, uh, inflation objective is something important, is a very dovish message, and we do expect the Fed to cut rates this summer. What about the ECB in all this? Because we've got a, an interesting moment today with uh, Christine Lagarde talking uh, in, in Europe, but also suggestions from her team that the review of their consideration of the inflation target, how they deal with it, could come much sooner than anyone expected, perhaps in the summer. Do you get a sense that, that this is one after 100 days in office uh, has begun to really take charge of the ECB in a more strong way than perhaps many had expected? I remember that the announcement was made uh, by Mrs. Lagarde that the results would be known by the end of the year. So if it um, if they already come um, by the summer, it would be pretty early because um, having myself worked for a central bank, it takes quite a long time to do a strategic uh, review. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, we, we do see that the macro data in, in Europe have been disappointing, especially inflation also, and in particular core inflation, core CPI has disappointed uh, in Europe. So for us, the ECB will remain in status quo, not much to do right now. And what we yeah. do think is some technical changes are possible. So, for example, include into the core CPI measure something uh, similar to the U.S. So, for example, an OER, so owner's equivalent rent, which is a housing market price index, to include something like that into Europe's uh, CPI number. Jiro, um, you've said that you expect a V-shaped recovery from any coronavirus impact and also that you expect a Fed rate cut in the summer. So is that an environment that's going to be supportive of equities?
but also of bond markets in 2020? We do think so. I mean, everything points into the direction that this Goldilocks scenario will continue with central banks injecting lots of liquidity, both in Europe and in the U.S. Inflation, inflationary pressures at least, being mainly absent. Wage pressures remain very subdued. That's also what we've seen on Friday in the payrolls number in the U.S. Um, and growth remains um, overall solid. Growth in the U.S. remains resilient. In Europe, we see some improvement at the beginning of uh, 2020. If you look at the, the PMIs that were revised up, suggesting a modest rebound. So growth remains resilient. Inflationary pressures absent. This is in line with the Goldilocks scenario on therefore also clearly a positive for risk assets, but also for bond markets. Just very briefly, Jiro, what's the biggest downside risk um, to your base case? Well, clearly, it's the coronavirus geopolitical risks, including um, also the possible trade um, frictions with uh, between the U.S. and, and Europe that might uh, might be coming up. All right, Jero, thanks very much indeed. Jero Jung there, Chief Economist at Mirabeau Asset Management, joining us live on the line from Geneva. And coming up in the next hour, we're going to be having Anna Edwards and Matt Miller taking the chairs on Daybreak Europe, speaking to Bilal Hafiz, who is CEO and editor of Macro Hive. Bilal spent over 20 years doing research at JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank and Namura. We'll be talking to him, I guess, about the impact of the virus. And in terms of the impact of the virus on markets today, we're seeing risk on broadly across assets. The stock 600 up almost seven tenths for percent an hour into the European equity market open. US futures positive and the 10-year yield moving higher. This is Bloomberg. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, work from home on a Friday jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, Soho jobs, Shoreditch jobs, keep me away from the central line jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, never ever boring jobs, small jobs, big jobs, lunch in borough market jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. Confucius once said, life is simple. But we insist on making it complicated. We're no philosophers, but at Sayat, we believe choosing your next car should be simple too. So we're offering the Ibiza FR with Beats Audio Sound System, 17-inch alloy wheels, and your choice of metallic paint for £199 a month with £840 initial rental. Why make life more complicated? Find your local retailer at sayat.co.uk. Price based on FR1 litre MPI with Beats Audio Sound System 48 month contract high of 5,000 miles per annum 18 and over orders until March 31st 2020 subject to status not in conjunction with any other offers. Damage charges may apply. No ownership. Say at financial services. I've got my own place now money. My parents put up the 10% security and when I keep up my repayments they get it back with interest in five years from Barclays. And now we can do whatever we want. Right Dave? We don't have to tiptoe up the stairs. I can paint the living room purple. Don't look at me like that money. It's my house. Barclays Family Springboard Mortgage. Make money work for you. Your home may be repossessed if mortgage payments are missed. Deposit returned with interest after five years if no repayments missed. Subject to application financial circumstances and borrowing history. T's and C's apply. World, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. What we're now seeing for the first time is this facade of absolute unity beginning to break down in the EU. We expect that there will be some type of slowdown recession beyond 2019. The European banking system, although recovering, hasn't recovered and there are areas of fragility. We've seen this before, trade talks that lead nowhere and then tariffs. We just swing from one to the other and markets get caught in the middle. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning from London. I'm Anna Edwards. And Matt Miller is apparently with me from Stuttgart. I can't hear him right now. I'm not sure if you can, but we will try and uh, make sure that he can hear us and, and, and we can hear him. You're listening to Daybreak Europe live on London DAB Digital Radio. Matt is in Stuttgart because he's going to be interviewing the CEO of Daimler a little bit later on. So we will uh, wait with anticipation for that interview. Really interesting to see the company talking uh, about how they're not 
content with the numbers, that disappointed with some of the performance, and yet uh, the stock goes higher in today's trading session. Although I guess the whole auto sector bouncing quite strongly today as we see global equity markets putting in a strong performance. Let's get to that strong performance then. We recap what's going on in markets every 15 minutes here on Bloomberg Radio. The stock 600 up by six tenths of one percent. The FTSE 100 up by nine tenths of a percent. The CAC Caron's up half a percent and the Zetradax up eight tenths of a percent. So moves to the upside, strong moves to the upside uh, for European equity markets. US futures uh, also point to the upside. So we'll watch out for that when we get to US equity uh, trading. Uh, you, so you, uh, European stocks up, US futures pointing higher. I also should tell you that oil prices have bounced a bit today, up by one and a half percent on Brent. We saw oil hitting a one year low in New York as there seemed to be little sign of emergency around setting up any kind of OPEC meeting. That's at the same time as we saw new highs on the S&P. So the stock story was positive in the US yesterday, uh, but uh, but uh, an underwhelming performance around oil because of what's going on with the uh, coronavirus, of course. On that note, deaths topping 1,000, but the mortality rate perhaps only 1%. Some of this analysis, though, still lacking all of the data that it needs. Uh, on other assets this morning, the dollar is fairly flat this morning. The euro against the dollar also fairly flat. Let's get to our market market conversation this morning and start with uh, the the moves to the upside in global equity markets despite the negative headlines around coronavirus. The coronavirus death toll has topped 1,000 with cases surpassing 43,000 globally. China's Hubei province, which is at the epicenter of the outbreak, reported its highest number of fatalities yet. But with infection rates stabilizing a bit, some businesses in China are restarting manufacturing. For more, let's bring in Bilal Hafiz, CEO and founder of macro hive. Bilal, good morning to you. Uh, So do you take comfort from this perhaps lower than expected mortality rate that's now been reported for this and the fact that the additional infections are maybe stabilizing? Is that what is giving the confidence to markets to rally at this point? I think certainly that is one big factor for why markets are uh, rallying right now. When we, when we speak to investors, most of them have uh, suddenly become uh, virus experts and they are focusing on the rate of change of the infection rate. So it's kind of the, the second derivative. And so as soon as we've seen the sign of stabilization, I think many people have taken that as a cue to go long uh, markets. At the same time, when you do speak to the experts, they all keep adding lots of disclaimers saying it's incredibly uncertain, all these estimates of fatality rates and so on. Um, and we still don't know how much of it has spread around the world. So I think one needs to be a bit more cautious around this all of course more markets right now are you know are fairly positive but i I would uh you know listen to the experts who kind of say they don't really know a huge amount about the spread of this Mm, matt uh, my colleague matt miller joins us from uh, from stuttgart he is now is now with us and uh, and listening in matt jump in yeah i'm just wondering what you think about the effects on what do we know now about the effects on businesses because i'm in stuttgart obviously mercedes uh daimler is heavily invested in china are 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 a lot of them going back to work do you expect it to be a huge issue in the in q1 yeah i mean the the early signs are that many are going back to work um what's interesting uh, you know within china is that different cities have different policies towards workers returning some are following a much more aggressive quarantine type policy where um, workers aren't uh, coming back to factories as much whereas other cities and provinces are seeing you know a, a more um, aggressive return to to work so i would say on balance it's mixed um but factories are are reopening the the larger kind of question here is how long this uncertainty would last. And so there's kind of two channels this affects, uh, you know, the economy. One is the uncertainty around all of this and second is the actual decline in production. And I think the uncertainty factor is probably something that will weigh on on global supply chains. Uh, Interesting to look at what the Chinese are doing to try and support their economy, Bilal. One of our colleagues, uh, well, columnist, Satajit Das, writing for Bloomberg Opinion, saying that China's $3 trillion FX reserve, you know, don't mistake that for for, for a big cash pile that they can just spend on supporting the economy. It's not that simple. Uh, Maybe we should look elsewhere for signs of the firepower that China has here. Does the PBOC have more up its sleeve, do you think? 
Well, certainly the PBOC does have more capacity, and 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 and, and the economist is correct in saying that the PBOC, the, the FX reserves aren't the thing to look at. I mean, they could cut reserve requirement ratios, they could inject more liquidity, they could um, extend more credit to uh, small and medium sized enterprises. So there are lots of different measures they they could do. The more fundamental question is that when an economy is experiencing, in effect, a supply shock, how much can a central bank really do to make much of a difference if people just aren't, you know, going out to shopping malls to buy if people if factories aren't being reopened what can the central bank do and so that's uh, the, that's kind of the bigger challenge here it's a to affect other economies i mean um clearly the chinese economy is a huge driver of global growth um what about the the um the part trade partner risk yeah, I think that's very, very significant, you know, and, you know, early this year, we put out, you know, kind of our kind of black swan, gray swan events for 2020. And one of them was an acceleration of deglobalization as countries put up capital controls, restrict uh, trade, you know, have more tr- trade wars and so on. And in some ways, all of this kind of feeds into that. This accelerates lots of those trends, you know, towards, um, you know, countries trying to um, deglobalize their supply chains, bring production back home to their own country. It also kind of has an impact on immigration policy as well. So I think this in some ways kind of accelerates lots of those trends that we're already seeing. However, it will take time to to change the supply chains. And uh, is that going to be material, Bilal? Because even if you see a reduced pace of globalization or a slight backward step in in that globalization dynamic, we do do still exist in a fairly globalized world to, to, to some to some degree. So, is is any back back uh, backtracking on globalization going to be material, or just something that the politicians like to talk about? A lot? No, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, it's it's very hard to deglobalize. Um, you know, we are an interconnected world. You know, not only are, are there you know supply chain, uh, not only there is there globalization on the production side, there's also globalization on the consumer side, which suddenly gives every country an incentive to trade with other countries. And most research kind of does show that, you know, globalized economy does generally help help economies. At the same time, what this has revealed is that having too much of the global supply chain concentrated in one country like China does in- introduce a fragility risk to the whole system. So what you need is some diversification of your production partners. And so perhaps maybe that's something we'll see going forward where people will, uh, you know, will say, look, not only will we want to have uh, production in China, we'll also want it in Eastern Europe or in Mexico, so there'll be more sort of diversification that you'll see there. Are there countries you think have done that the best or companies that you think have done that the best? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's certain U.S. Uh, I think U.S. companies have done quite you know, have started to move along those lines uh, faster than, say, European companies have. And I think part of that is to do with Trump, frankly. Um, so you are seeing many of those companies sort of shift towards Mexico or Vietnam or other, other countries. I think the other country that looks interesting on that front is Japan, you know, uh, and that's more to do with Japan's poor demographics, where they've been shifting production to other Asian countries over the last five to ten years, so whether it's Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. So Japan, I think, is another one that has, has been moving along these lines. Um, the, the trouble with Japan is that it has a huge uh, energy dependency on the rest of the world, which kind of makes it, uh, you know, which, which makes it kind of more fragile in, in, on the energy side. Bilal, thank you very much. Bilal Hafiz, CEO and founder at Macro Hive. Let's get over now to Leanne Garens with your global news headlines. Matt, good morning. Let's start with more on the impact of the coronavirus. Singapore is bracing for a 25 to 30 percent plunge in tourism after the virus outbreak. The city is losing up to 20,000 visitors a day, and that could get worse if the coronavirus persists. China accounts for about 20 percent of Singapore's tourism. The tourism board CEO Keith Tan says the sector is calling for help. The main cry that I'm hearing is help right now from the entire tourism industry. Uh, There's lots of anecdotal evidence of business drying up, but that's not surprising given how how much China uh, contributes to our visitor arrivals. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to push ahead with the HS2 high-speed rail project linking London to northern England. That comes despite political opposition and spiralling costs. The new route will be the UK's biggest ever infrastructure project and currently Europe's largest. But the price tag could reach more than £100 billion and the first trains might not start running until 2031. German Chancellor Angela Merkel will take an active role in choosing her next successor. 
Twitter. That's after her heir apparent, Annegret Kram Karrenbauer, decided to step down and not run for the chancellorship. She confirmed her decision during a speech at the CDU's headquarters. Ich werde mich nicht um eine Kanzlerkandidatur I will not run as a chancellor candidate. Just as I have announced this, I am leading the process to come to a chancellor candidate for the CDU, the union. The final straw was last week when a local chapter of the CDU defied her orders and voted alongside the far right. And in the US, President Trump has released his annual budget. He's proposing deep cuts to social programs but increases in defense and entitlement spending. The move would push the gross federal debt above $30 trillion over the next decade. The budget is more a list of policy aspirations. It is no binding power and federal spending is decided by Congress. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by bloomberg powered by more than 2700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries i'm leanne gerens this is bloomberg anna leanne thank you now the morning sports news here's william esler arsenal boss Mikel arteta says the premier league's winter break has come at the perfect time he's taken a squad to dubai for some warm weather training ahead of their next match with newcastle on sunday Arteta took over as manager in mid-December and feels he needed the extra time with the players. For us it's very useful. We haven't had time to work together 20 or 24 players for more than four days since I joined because we had uh, so many games. So we needed a bit of getaway, put things in place and train, you know, so I think it's going to be useful. Brentford boss Thomas Frank thinks Leeds are scared about visiting Griffin Park this evening. The two sides meet in the Championship and a win for the London side would move them above the Orchard Club. Brentford could go second with a win, but Nottingham Forest could also move into the top two with a win at home to Charlton. And just one race meeting has survived the weather today. There are eight races at Newcastle as part of their all-weather championships. Air and Lingfield have been cancelled due to waterlogged tracks. Let's get the U.S. sports now with Pete Fox. From the night in the association, the Brooklyn Nets get past the Indiana Pacers at Bankers Life. 106-105, Spencer Dinwiddie with 21, which included the game-winning bucket in the final seconds. In San Francisco at Chase Center, Andrew Wiggins made his debut for the Warriors, scoring 18. Damian Lee had 26. The Golden State falls short to the Heat, 113-101. From the night in the NHL, the Calgary Flames jumped out early on the Sharks in San Jose, 3-0. Thing. They never looked back, cruising to victory 6-2. And in D.C. at the Capital One Arena, Beauvillier with a pair of goals as the Islanders down the Caps 5-3. I'm Pete Fox, that's your Bloomberg NBC World Sports Update. Thanks to Pete for that. Still ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. We also see in pre-market that Sprint shares are soaring. Sprint soaring 65% pre-market, T-Mobile said, to get the judges okay. So will that consolidation story finally, finally come to fruition? We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about other tech issues uh, surrounding U.S. tech and indeed the U.S. appetite for investment into Back, telecoms infrastructure. That's also something of, a, of, a, uh, of an interesting topic this week. Bovillier this is Bloomberg. Asset managers have seized change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few actors with a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said to have approved T-Mobile's $26.5 billion takeover of the wireless carrier. Sprint surges in late trade as a judge is said
This is what Invesco does every day, because they believe the possibilities of life and investing are greater when we come together. Invesco, let's invest in greater possibilities together. To learn more, visit Invesco.com slash together. Invesco Distributors Incorporated. You know your body, and you know when something's off, when something doesn't feel quite right. Don't ignore symptoms like fatigue, joint pain, rashes, and fever. They could be signs of lupus. Listen to your body. Take care of yourself. We're here to help you take control of your health. Learn how at BeFierceTakeControl.org. Brought to you by the Lupus Foundation of America and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. Here's Francine Lacroix. Joining us, actually, is Fiona Frank from Images Fiona, when you look at the coronavirus, how do you view it from a market perspective? It's interesting because macro news were quite good. Central Bank have shown that they are there. It can be the U.S. Central Bank, the European Central Bank, or even the China Central Bank, and inflation is lower. So on an economical front, if you look, it's quite good, but the problem is it's backward looking. And then you have this uh, coronavirus, which has two impact curves from demand on China, which could have an influence on global demand and therefore on global growth. And uh, therefore also output. But to a point where actually we could, we could see the, the seeds of a possible recession, Fiona, or, or not so much? So is it slowing growth? For the moment, we see slowing growth. And the problem is with the coronavirus, and, and it's... So, and with the response that China has done, which is incredibly powerful of quarantining all these people, uh, the impact it can have on consumption uh, and on output for some global companies can be quite important. So the question is, how long will it last? And uh, so it's more of a wild card today for us that we are looking at, but we keep our positioning, which is still positive on the macro side because growth is still there in the U.S., not brilliant in Europe, uh, no inflation and accommodative central banks, which will be ready to step in if there is a problem. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg European headquarters here in London, I'm Caroline Hepke with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. So European stocks are up this morning, six-tenths of one percent. We also saw gains in Asia, along, of course, with the U.S. Uh, equity futures. The S&P 500 yesterday hit another record high. Uh, that's, of course, despite the rising deaths from coronavirus and also the number of new cases, uh, although they do seem to be slowing somewhat today. In terms of uh, the particular companies that we're looking at, Daimler shares gaining 2.2% this hour on the turnaround effort of the of the CEO Ola Kalenius. Also TUI jumping 12%. Uh, the uh, holiday company first quarter was weak but Morgan Stanley notes that the summer looks strong. Of course this after the demise of rival Thomas Cook. Uh, as for the bond markets, virus induced rally in the US uh, Treasury market continues. Um, in terms of yields at the moment we gain a basis point uh, for US benchmark yields. Uh, so we trade at one spot, five eight percent. Uh, this, as we're looking at uh, the U.S. bond markets flirting with a broad inversion of the yield curve, is that's mainly being blamed on uh, the global coronavirus issue rather than as a harbinger of a U.S. recession. Uh, still to come, though, UK fourth quarter GDP figures are out in just a few minutes, so we'll watch that. Sterling at the moment trades at one spot two nine one eight, so flat. Bloomberg dollar spot index slightly weak at tenth of one percent. The euro trades at one spot zero nine one two. That is a Bloomberg business flat. Now, here's Leanne Gerrans with more what's going on around the world. Good morning, Caroline. The death toll from the coronavirus has topped 1,000. There are now over 43,000 confirmed cases worldwide. That's as criticism mounts over China's transparency in its handling of the epidemic. President Xi Jinping visited a hospital yesterday, his first public appearance since the death of the doctor who spoke about the coronavirus. BlackRock has promised to put climate change concerns at the centre of its investment strategy, but that didn't stop activists from storming its Paris office yesterday. Protesters barricaded the premises, spraying red paint on the floors and covering walls with graffiti. The firm has seen protesters in other cities over the past few years. 
and Turkey says it has carried out a sweeping retaliation for a deadly attack on its troops in Syria. It's hit over 100 targets and officials estimate they may have killed scores of pro-Assad forces. The response came after pro-government forces killed five Turkish soldiers in the northwest province of Idlib. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Opinion. Informed perspectives and expert data-driven commentary on breaking news. It is 920 in the city. Time to check in with Bloomberg Opinion. We're joined by opinion columnist Alex Webb, who's writing about T-Mobile's takeover of Sprint, uh, which is which a judge is said to have finally approved. Um, this is uh, just... The news that's been – I've been reporting the possibility of this kind of combination for 20 years. That's how long speculation um, has persisted. And actually, I was there when Deutsche Telekom bought T-Mobile, um, which I'm sure I've told you about 20 times, Alex. But what, what, what is the significance of this finally happening? I mean, I mean it's a, it means a lot for the ability to invest in 5G. You know, one of the reasons that Nokia and Ericsson haven't been as yet huge beneficiaries of, of the tribulations of Huawei is because there, there's been a, a recalcitrance and reluctance to actually invest in 5G networks on the part of T-Mobile and Sprint until they know that the deal's going through. So that means that then when this is finally, you know, greenlit, there are still a few more tiny steps to go, but when this is finally greenlit, then they can charge ahead with that investment. Now, for the carriers as a whole, it's quite good news because it gives them even more pricing power. You know, we've seen that... Um, U.S. has far higher average revenue per user than almost any other country in the world, certainly any, any country in Europe. And that's partly because they ultimately have essentially four carriers in a uh, you know, market of 300 million uh, people. In Europe, we have something like 180, in the same, 180 carriers in the same sort of population. And so the... Those, that revenue per user has been declining gradually over the past decade as, you know, products haven't really innovated. And as uh, the number of carriers decreases, that should give them ability to increase that pricing again. Why did it take so long to get to this point, Alex? Well, because it is ultimately for that very reason. Is it good for consumers to go from four carriers to three? And there's a lot of skepticism that it is. Now, the argument made by the carriers is the one about networks. If, we're, if there are fewer of us, we have the capital to invest in those networks. But, you know, the odds are it, it, it could mean more expensive prices going forward. Now, there's another big deal or a possibility of another huge deal with Xerox and HP that you've been writing about for Bloomberg Opinion. You think uh, Xerox has the firepower to pull it off? I think it does just about. I don't actually think that's the deal that will happen when, um, it, when you know, it all washes out. I think that the deal is more likely to happen is that HP ultimately ends up being the senior partner and buying Xerox. Xerox ultimately is pulling out every stop to try to get HP to the negotiating table. Let's put this in context. Like, HP is three times bigger than Xerox by market cap. Now, the, fact, the only way that Xerox is able to do this is that HP has significant capacity for debt. So it's essentially a, a sort of leverage buyout by Xerox. It, it by HP, use its debt, debt capacity to, to pay for the deal itself. Is that something, and it's a cash and stock deal that they're proposing. Now, is that in the interest of both sets of shareholders to end up with a highly levered company? Probably not. And so um, you'll probably see it change slightly if negotiations do formally commence. What's the driver for putting these two businesses together, Alex? The printer, the printer industry in the whole is in decline. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Xerox has had uh, maybe a slightly rougher deal of this than HP, which has done okay in, in, in PCs. And the idea is obviously that if you consolidate, they're in slightly different pieces of the printer business. Xerox a lot bigger in the big printers, photocopiers, things like that. HP and the smaller ones, if you combine those together, you can reduce R&D costs, reduce um, the, the n- need to do duplicate sales networks and, and pump them through more sales channels. And so there is a good industrial logic to it. At the moment, it looks a lot like Xerox doing some financial engineering without um, HP necessarily be willing to buy into that story. There is um, an Ericsson and Nokia story as well. I wonder, um, you know, with all the hubbub around Huawei, what do you think about the network equipment suppliers? Uh, so... Th- 
on Friday, William Barr, the Attorney General, gave the slightly puzzling statement that uh, the US should think about investing in or buying a majority stake in Nokia and or Ericsson. Now, frankly, this will never happen. You know, there's no, you know, <laughs> the likelihood of the US, why would they invest in these companies? Well, to inject capital in them. And if you're going to buy 50% of the company, the only way you're injecting capital is if it would be a capital increase. These okay. companies have good access to capital, so they don't need that sort of investment. Okay, well, we'll see that. Let's see how that develops. And Larry Cudlow sort of pouring cold water on that suggestion also. Thanks very much, Bloomberg Opinion columnist Alex Webb. When we come back, we'll talk more about the UK growth story with UK GDP. This is Bloomberg. With a Bloomberg Business of Sports report, I'm Michael Barr. Bloomberg has learned the proposed sale of the New York Mets to billionaire hedge fund titan Steve Cohen was scuttled by a disagreement over a clause that would have allowed the current owners to control the franchise for five years after the deal had closed. That probably won't happen again. According to a person familiar with the matter, no preconditions regarding control of the team will be attached to the upcoming sale. According to sports consultant Mark Gannis, by showing a willingness to see the control issue at the outset, the Wilpons may actually reap more than the Major League Baseball record $2.6 billion. As was the case with the Cohen deal, no part of the team's profitable regional sports network, SNY, will be included in the sale. And that is a Bloomberg Business of Sports report. I'm Michael Barr, brought to you by Granger, America's trusted source for industrial and safety supplies. Visit Granger.com. What if you could keep the top economic experts in a conference room next to your office without having to feed them? Do we need better optics? Do we need some substance? Do CEOs care about ESG? We have seen quite a lot of stimulus pumped into the system already. It's the biggest warning yet about the financial risks of climate change. Now, there are more ways to hear us. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com and iHeartRadio apps, and at BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Hello, I'm here to tell you that age really does bring wisdom, and you may still have plenty to contribute. At Eisner Amper, we're successful at helping business owners and entrepreneurs assess and plan for the future, as well as maximize where you are in the present. If you're curious about how to plan for both your professional and personal future, come and talk to us. I'm Lisa Stewart, Principal in Charge of the Center for Family Business Excellence, and I'd love to help you to find the right path forward. You can find us at EisnerAmper.com slash family. Finding your perfect new home can be tough. So if you keep missing out... It's time to search out... There are thousands of new properties to buy or rent every month at onthemarket.com. 24 hours or more before they're on Rightmove or Zoopla. See them first. Set up a property alert today. Search on the market.com to find your perfect home. If you're in the market, search on the market.com. See on the market.com forward slash new and exclusive. Agents specify exclusivity. Send message to Elise. Salut. Sorry, I'm running late. Just in the car now. Send. Ah, I forgot the cake. Send. Actually, great news. Satnav has found a new route. See you in 10. Message on the move in the Citroen C1 and stay connected. Experience Citroen C1, available from £149 per month with initial rental of £149. Citroen. Please drive responsibly. Citroen UK Limited is a credit broker, not a lender. Personal lease. You will not own the vehicle. Offer on field VTI 72.5 speed manual. 6,000 miles per annum. Guarantee may be required. Terms, eligibility criteria and return conditions apply. PSA Finance UK Limited. <laughs> The sound of a Halifax customer who used to worry she wasn't saving enough, but is now saving the change on every morning brew. Switch on Save the Change, and when you use your Halifax Visa debit card, we'll round up to the nearest pound and put the difference into your chosen Halifax savings account. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. Sign up to Walk All Over Cancer with Cancer Research UK. Walk 10,000 steps every day in March, and together we will beat cancer. Are you ready, Boo? It's a sunny day, perfect for walking. Start walking. Use the 10,000 Steps a Day Challenge to team up and bring friends and family together to help beat cancer. Come on, search Walk All Over Cancer and sign up now. Good morning, this is your southern service to London, Victoria. Join in our onboard quiz. Here's our next clue. What C sounds like a handheld party food but keeps you dry and protected from the rain? Not canapes? 
canopies. At Southern Railway, we're investing over £7 million into making improvements for you, like canopies, cycle parking and new platform lighting across more of our stations. Find out more and book your tickets at southernrailway.com. Southern Railway, we're with you. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Broadcasting live to London on DAB Digital Radio. To New York, Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991. To Boston, Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco, Bloomberg 960. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning. It is 10.30 a.m. here in Stuttgart, 9.30 there in London. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Anna Edwards. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Uh, we uh, are getting some breaking news on the UK economy. So UK uh, GDP unchanged in the fourth quarter as forecast. The UK economy growing by 0.3% in December. The forecast was for an increase of uh, 0.2%. So we'll get some further analysis on what this growth number means in just a moment from our colleagues from Bloomberg Economics. Jamie Rush will be with us shortly to talk about this. We check the markets, though, every 15 minutes minutes on Bloomberg Radio, so let's do that just now. Uh, we should start then with UK assets, I suppose. The cable rate, 129.25. We see the pound not moving all that much as a result of that data. It is up by one-tenth of a percent, so maybe that is a, a slight move, but 129.27 for cable uh, for the pound against the US dollar as we see that number coming through on the UK economy, growing 0.3% in December. The forecast was for 0.2%. Uh, the FTSE 100 is up by seven-tenths of one percent, but that's part of the global trend Stock 600 up by six tenths of a percent. The DAX up by seven tenths. The CAC 40 up by four tenths of a percent. All of that really being driven by overnight gains in U.S. markets. So the S&P hitting a new all-time high in the U.S. yesterday. Markets choosing to put concerns around coronavirus, if not to the sidelines, then certainly in perspective, and focus instead on the potential for growth in the U.S. Focus on Jerome Powell, who will be speaking later. Just how dovish will his statement be? His testimony on Capitol Hill, and also focus on the earnings story, which is. Uh, very current, of course. U.S. futures point higher, up by between one and three tenths of a percent for U.S. equity markets when we get there. We are seeing a bounce in oil prices this morning, 54.21 on Brent. That is up by 1.8 percent compared to the close yesterday. We saw oil prices particularly weak in uh, New York yesterday, as it seemed the market was coming around to this idea there wasn't going to be any hurried meeting of OPEC and OPEC friends to try and address oversupply in that industry. We do see a little bit uh, less appetite for fixed income today, so the yield on the U.S. 10-year is a little higher at 1.58%. FX markets in general fairly stable as we wait, as I say, for Jerome Powell to speak a little bit later. Matt, let's uh, dive into some of these numbers, shall we, on the U.K. economy. Let's do that for sure. Um, We got some GDP figures here. We got some... um, growth, uh, although we were expecting it. We're joined now by Bloomberg Economics Chief Economist Jamie Rush right now. Um, Jamie, what do you make of the of the reading? Well, I think at face value, you see that the, the economy basically flatlined in 4Q, and you, you look at that and you think, oh my god, what the bank doing? Why didn't they cut interest rates? But actually, if you look under the, under the hood a bit, the December data looked really good. I mean, there's nothing there that tells you that the economy isn't doing okay. So the, the number to focus on there is the is the strong growth of services uh, output in, in December. That, that rose 0.3% in December. So what that tells you is that the economy is starting to, to revive after this, this soft patch in, in October and November. And if you look ahead, if you look to, to this quarter... Um, actually, that's looking very good as well. So the PMI ab- bounced really quite stupendously at the end of the year uh, and into this one. And so it points to growth of 0.3. So that's about the, the UK's trend growth rate. So actually, the Bank of England doesn't look mad after all. <laughs> so there we see, come a long way in one, in, one, uh, in one thought, I suppose, Jamie, there. So the UK, UK economy did avoid contraction. I suppose that's the glass half, half full way of looking at no growth, isn't it? Uh, 
and, and as you suggest, there's been this inflection point in December all around the election. Have we got, uh, as we get further away from December the 12th then, do we have a sense that there is some rebound in the UK economy taking place? Yeah, I really think there is. I mean, if you look at the, the sentiment indicators, the PMI, if you look at uh, the Lloyd's Business Barometer, if you look at some of the CBI gauges, all the soft stuff is telling us that people are feeling better about, about the economy. So I, I think that things are, are, are kind of okay. I mean, I guess the, the risk is that this was this, all this information we have now pertains to the very beginning of this quarter, uh, before the coronavirus stuff all, all really kind of uh, kicked off. And so um, we're, we're going to have to monitor that. That's the next thing to watch very closely. What do you expect from the coronavirus? What kind of impact? I mean, I know there's a lot of uncertainty there, but ballpark it for us. So we did, we did some analysis where we looked at the, SAR, the impact of SARS uh, on China. Uh, and so we think that the annual growth in China will drop to about 4.5% instead of 6% in the first quarter. Um, that's a pretty big shock. We still think that's roughly the right ballpark. Um, but we think it will reverse pretty quickly as, as it's contained. Um, so what really the, the impact there is, is how does the reduction in Chinese imports affect the rest of the world? And how does the, the, the reduction of exports of crucial parts of supply chains affect the world? And, and the answer is... Um, it's going to have some impact noticeably, I think, in, on 1Q growth. So we're probably going to revise down our forecast for 1Q for the euro area, for the UK, before we revise down for the US. So it's, it's going to be not too big, not too long-lasting, uh, but we think probably detectable. So detectable. And interesting to think about the rest of Europe and how this coronavirus effect plays out, because we talk a lot about supply chains, and that affects manufacturing companies, but mm-hmm. then there's also the exposure that European companies have in the services sector. Over, And I'm mm-hmm. thinking of luxury goods companies and that sort of thing you know we heard from Burberry a a little while ago they had to shut so many of their stores the ones that were open saw huge drops in footfall and huge drops in sales so Mm. how does that play out when you're looking at Germany versus France versus Italy where where this fallout is going to hit the hardest we've got a pretty good feel on the supply chain stuff so if you look on Bico Go that's where our research is you'll find some insights on um, on the supply chain impact Uh, we use like this value add database to work out which country is most exposed I mean it's not surprising the answer is, is Germany is most exposed. Um, the interesting thing is, of course, that it only takes one little one little um, a reduction or one part missing to shut down a production line. Uh, so the the impact uh, could be quite large on manufacturing. Indeed, um, we know that the sector is already struggling. December was an absolutely horrific month for produ- for producers in in the eurozone. So January is not looking a huge amount better. Okay, thanks very much, Jamie Bloomberg, Economics Chief Economist Jamie Rush talking to us there about the coronavirus, which is um, something that's probably going to affect um, uh, the the Daimler first quarter earnings as well. Something I'm going to talk to the CEO of Daimler about, which is why I'm here in Stuttgart. Let's get the latest in global news right now. For that, we go to Bloomberg's Leanne Garrett. Leanne? Matt, good morning. The death toll from the coronavirus has topped 1,000. There are now 43,000 confirmed cases worldwide. That's as criticism mounts over China's transparency in its handling of the epidemic. President Xi Jinping visited a hospital yesterday, his first public appearance since the death of the doctor who spoke about the coronavirus. The UK and EU are raising the stakes ahead of talks about their new trading relationship. The Chancellor set out a plan for financial services to diverge from EU rules and a new draft of the EU's negotiating mandate toughens their stances on unfair competition, fishing and human rights. Bloomberg's George Schenker reports. Sajid Javid says he wants a, quote, durable trading relationship for banks, but writing in City AM, he says there will be differences in the UK's rules on financial services. Javid also says he wants a reliable process of equivalence under which regulations on both sides are judged to be adequately aligned. At the same time, the document on which Brussels is basing its negotiating position has been revised now to ratchet up its demands on significant areas, including fishing. Both sides seem to want to start the talks at the beginning of March with the toughest possible stance. In London, George Shanker, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Ireland's main political parties face weeks of talks to form a government after Saturday's general election. Bloomberg's Peter Flanagan has all the details. Main opposition party Fianna Fáil is projected to be the biggest party, while Sinn Féin is likely to finish second. Yet both are well short of the 80 seats needed for a majority, and the coalition of Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin and the Green Party is most likely according to betting odds. 
While Fianna Fáil leader Michal Martin vowed not to work with Sinn Féin before the vote, he has since softened his tone. In Dublin, Peter Flanagan, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel will take an active role in choosing her next successor. That's after her heir apparent, Annegret Kram karrenbauer decided to step down and not run for the chancellorship. AKK, as she's known, was unable to snap her authority on the party. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Anna. Leanne, thank you. Now with your morning sports news, here's William Esler. Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta says the Premier League's winter break has come at the perfect time. He's taken a squad to Dubai for some warm weather training ahead of their next match with Newcastle on Sunday. Arteta took over as manager in mid-December and feels he needed the extra time with the players. For us it's very useful. We haven't had time to work together 20 or 24 players for more than four days since I joined because we had so many games. So we needed a bit of get away, put things in place and train, you know, so I think it's going to be useful. Brentford boss Thomas Frank thinks Leeds are scared about visiting Griffin Park this evening. The two sides meet in the championship and a win for the London side would move them above the Orchard Club. Brentford could go second with the win, but Nottingham Forest could also move into the top two with a win at home to Charlton. And just one race meeting has survived the weather today. There are eight races at Newcastle as part of their all-weather championships. Air and Lingfield have been cancelled due to waterlogged tracks. Now let's get the U.S. sports with Pete Fox. Pete? No? In fact, no, let's not course. do that. Not enough time to do that. So let me di- let me t- let me yeah, make the point, Matt, that you are of course in Stuttgart, and coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, uh, Daimler has slashed its dividend by two thirds as it gears up for change in the sector. Matt can take us through that story next. This is Bloomberg. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately eight million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why Save by the Scan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. Save by the Scan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. More than just a game, baseball is big business. For the chief revenue officer of the New York Mets, this means overseeing complex operations, key financial drivers, and interpreting data to make critical decisions every day. How is your business managing complexity? Cone Resnick can help you improve performance through an integrated business planning strategy that optimizes your data, streamlines processes, and keeps you ahead of the competition. Explore more at coneresnick.com slash MLB. Cone Resnick, advisory assurance tax. Transform your game. Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at bevel.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard? Or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Not every pleasure is a guilty one. Instead of making resolutions you'll never keep this new year, why not promise yourself something you'll actually enjoy? Like sitting down with the Guardian and the Observer. Curling up with the weekend papers is the perfect way to switch off from screens and take a moment or two for yourself. You can really take your time with our award-winning magazines, long reads, recipes, reviews and more. Start the year as you mean to go on. Pick up The Guardian or The Observer today. At Wix, we'll create your dream kitchen from design to show-off ready and take care of everything. And now, save a third on showroom kitchen units. Book your free design appointment today. Cure your house embarrassment with Wix. For minimum spend, terms and exclusions, see wix.co.uk. What do you do to be an everyday superhero like Dan? So my baby boy Ben and me just wanted to share what we do to look after the environment. 
we put the wet wipes we use in the bin instead of down the loo. It would be pretty nasty if that lot ended up blocking our pipes. Wet wipes and nappies block thousands of pipes every year. Save our sewers, rivers and seas by putting them in the bin where they belong. Visit thameswater.co.uk forward slash bin it. Together, we can care for the environment. Wouldn't it be nice to keep things you normally lose? Your favourite scarf, your train of thought, or your mobile data? Because with most other networks, you get to the end of the month and your data is, well, never to be seen again. But unlike anyone else, with Sky Mobile, you can roll and keep all your unused data for up to three years. Sky Mobile. Hello, possible. Full terms and conditions at sky.com slash mobile. Do you do the same thing every weekend? You know, meet up with the same friends for brunch, browse around the same shops, eat the same Saturday night takeaway. Mine's a lamb with mushroom pilau rice. Snuggle up next to the same person and watch the same brain-numbing reality TV. Then maybe it's time to switch it up. Starting with the all-new Vauxhall Corsa, with its bold styling and up to 70 miles per gallon. To switch it up, visit your local Vauxhall dealership or search new Corsa. Official WLTP test figures for comparison purposes only. Real world figures may vary. Good morning. This is your southern service to London, Victoria. Join in our onboard quiz. Here's our next clue. What C sounds like a handheld party food but keeps you dry and protected from the rain? Not canapes. Canopies. At Southern Railway, we're investing over £7 million into making improvements for you, like canopies, cycle parking, and new platform lighting across more of our stations. Find out more and book your tickets at southernrailway.com. Southern Railway, we're with you. The comedian Louis C.K. is on tour now for the first time since his sexual misconduct against other comedians was brought to light. This week on the New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with critic Hilton Alls about how Louis C.K. is addressing the issue in his act or not addressing it. And more broadly, we'll talk about when and how a disgraced performer should come back before the public. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. The 2020 NBA All-Star Game is live on TuneIn Premium. Catch every fast break, fadeaway, and alley-oop as Team LeBron and Team Giannis go head-to-head in Chicago. Deep three, and in! Oh, man! Five to shoot, LeBron long three, good! Which star will shine the brightest? Who will be named this year's MVP? Find out Sunday at 8 Eastern with ESPN Radio's live coverage of the NBA All-Star Game on TuneIn. Search Premium to upgrade today. Markets, headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg European headquarters here in London, I'm Caroline Hepker with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. So a thousand people have now died from the coronavirus, but China is urging the nation's biggest companies to meet production targets. Xi Jinping, the president, saying uh, on Monday that the impact on China's economy from the virus will be short term and won't derail uh, longer term improvements. This is the main story that markets are obviously following. Having said that, we see a bounce higher for European equities right now, up six-tenths of one percent. This follows uh, surges that we saw in Asian equity trading and also the U.S. S&P 500 yesterday hitting a fresh record high. Uh, Looking at uh, U.S. futures right now, the S&P 500 futures gain a tenth of one percent. In terms of individual stocks that we've been tracking, uh, Daimler shares gaining right now on the turnaround efforts of the CEO, despite all the challenges uh, for the car maker. Tui shares also jumping significantly. The first quarter was weak, but Morgan Stanley Stanley noting that the summer bookings look very strong after, of course, the demise of Thomas Cook, a key rival for a package holiday tours here in Europe. In terms of the bond markets uh, this morning, it's all about uh, the potential for another broad-based yield curve inversion. At the moment, we trade at one spot 5-8% for US benchmark yield to up. 
by one and a half basis points. We also jump uh, two basis points higher for German benchmark yields at negative 38 basis points. And just lastly, in the oil market, to check uh, there, we uh, trade higher by 1.4% on WTI crude. So we're just above the 50 handle, $50.25 the barrel. Brent crude at $54.04. That is a Bloomberg business flash. Now here's Leanne Goins with more on what's going on around the world. Good morning. Good morning, Caroline. China's largest cities remain virtual ghost towns because of the coronavirus outbreak. Shanghai and Beijing have returned to work after the extended 17-day Lunar New Year holiday, but streets were deserted and many offices were empty. Many businesses have told employees to work from home. The death toll from the virus has now climbed to over a 1,000. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to push ahead with the HS2 high-speed rail project linking London to Northern England. That comes despite political opposition and spiralling costs. The new route will be the UK's biggest ever infrastructure project and currently Europe's largest, but the price tag could reach more than £100 billion. And the first trains may not start running until 2031. And Copenhagen and Denmark and Bern and Switzerland have been jointly named the most livable cities in the world. The annual study for workers considering relocating looks at factors like housing, infrastructure and health services. The highest ranked UK city was Edinburgh, joint 19th, while London was in the joint 47th spot with Belfast. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Matt. I have a friend from Copenhagen, actually. So do I. <laughs> and don't I've we been, all? Yes, don't we all? And I've been to Copenhagen. So not just do I have a friend, I've physically been there for a wedding. My friend got married there. I'm not sure I was the best talking about to Sandra. Me. Yeah, our producer, Sandra <laughs> Kilhoff, is from Copenhagen. And I'm sure she would... Actually, I don't know what she would think. I haven't asked her uh, if she thinks Copenhagen is better. Well, I know that she likes to fly the flag for Copenhagen. So. She's definitely, yes, she's Danish, for show. <laughs> we should have her on to talk about uh, how great Copenhagen is, because I think it's pretty great, too. Yes, it's amazing, and all the open rye bread sandwiches they make. I don't actually know the official name, but they're very good. Um, Small boat. I, oh, there we are. Anna there we are. I can't say it properly. <laughs> Good try. Delicious. Okay, let's get over right now to Nathan Hager. He is not Danish, as far as I you know. You had me a Danish. Um, <laughs> now I'm hungry. You're planning on, and you can have some small brot. Oh, uh, thanks. You're, you're planning on, uh, you're, you're getting ready for your show this morning with yeah. Karen Moscow. What do you got planned? Well, presidential politics is front and center for us this morning. A lot of voters in New Hampshire up early, getting ready to cast their ballots, and uh, polls going in suggest this race in the Granite State is Bernie Sanders to lose. What about the rest of the country? Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli is going to be with us from Manchester, the uh, one of the many sites of uh, primary voting this morning in the Granite State. We're going to look at the market implications of this race as well with Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy Advisors. Uh, plus, as you mentioned, the corona, uh, coronavirus death toll has now hit the four-figure mark. And though the disease itself appears to be slowing, what will it mean for a slowing global economy? That could be a question posed to Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell as he begins two days of testimony on Capitol Hill later this morning. We'll preview that with NatWest Markets economist Kevin Cummins. He will join me in Karen Moscow this morning on Bloomberg Daybreak. Hope you'll listen in as well. Matt. Absolutely looking forward to it. Nathan, thanks so much. Nathan Hager and Karen Moscow. Up next, if you're listening on Sirius XM in New York, good morning. If you're listening on London DAB Digital Radio, you will hear Bloomberg Surveillance. And I want to break uh, also a piece of news here. Um, Anna, yesterday we were talking a lot about NMC mm. and uh, it was it, uh, possibly a target for KKR and others. Well, I now see that KKR says it does not intend to make an offer for NMC. Yeah, and we see that the share price of NMC is down 12% on that. Uh, we saw it uh, on the rise, obviously, yesterday in uh, in the in the wake of that announcement. Interesting that Muddy Waters, who initially uh, threw mud, I suppose, at, at NMC and some of its practices, said that the NMC recent disclosures and share sales just reinforced their view. Of course, NMC uh, denies any, wrongdo- any wrongdoing, any of the allegations that, that Muddy Waters made at it. We'll keep an eye on that 
business or London listed Middle East focused healthcare provider. Let's talk about some of the other corporate news flow today. Daimler shares are up this morning after the company said it expects earnings before interest and tax for the year to grow significantly compared to 2019. The turnaround effort comes after three profit warnings since May last year and today the German car maker is also slashing its dividend to 90 euro cents a share. For more we're joined by Bloomberg Senior Editor for Global Business Benedict Camel. Matt you're there in Stuttgart because you're ready to interview the boss of course of uh, of of Daimler. Uh, but, but Benedict let's get your thoughts. I mean this is an interesting one isn't it because the company's saying that they're not pleased with the performance and yet they haven't been aggressively sold off by the market today. Yes, so the, as you say, the, the sort of the, the body language and the words coming out of Daimler and Stuttgart are pretty muted. Uh, the CEO, Ola Schelenio, saying we can't be satisfied with a set of results. Uh, the CFO uh, similarly saying we must, must improve uh, the way that we do business, the way that we make money. Um, and you saw, as you said in the beginning, the stock rise ever so slightly, or actually quite a bit. It was up 4%, but now it's sort of trailed off a bit. People are digesting the numbers. They're seeing that the dividend has come down. The reason why they're slashing the dividend is they have to basically conserve money, save money that they can then pump into uh, the electrification of their fleet, battery powered cars. They're quite aggressive on that front. They want to get 20 new plug-in hybrid and fully electric cars uh, by uh, in a couple of years, 2022 is their target, and that'll cost them a lot of money. Uh, so that's where they're taking some money from, from the dividend, from shareholders essentially, and putting it into that pot. By the way, I was planning on asking the CEO how the coronavirus is impacting business. Right now, we've heard from TUI and Michelin, and neither one of those seem really too phased. What do you think? Yeah, that seems to be sort of generally the, the mood in the industry right now. Uh, we heard from Daimler this morning they have a factory in, in Beijing that the production there has restarted. So uh, they are probably cautious about it, but nobody's panicking about it, it seems, at the moment on the corporate side. It'll, we have seen from other companies like the consumer goods uh, sector, they've been a little bit harder hit because a lot of that has to do with sort of consumer sentiment. People aren't that happy to spend, to travel and so on. We'll get uh, air bus numbers in two days. Again, that'll be interesting. Anything that sort of has to do with consumer behavior, with traveling, getting out, hitting the shops, going where a lot of other people are, those are the, typically the kinds of industries where you'll probably have more of an effect. With Daimler, that's less pronounced. Yeah, although interesting to see the numbers out of, well, the, the comments out of TUI today, where they were suggesting that they hadn't seen any dip in bookings, I suppose, maybe what's bad for Asia travel, Europe-Asia travel, is good for intra-European travel, but we'll see how that theme develops. Uh, sticking with Daimler, though, Benny, uh, many of these car makers then pushing towards battery powered cars. Uh, Daimler doesn't seem to have much traction, uh, I understand. So, what, what is the what is the what is the latest on their push there? Anna, you know, I, look, you you were just recently shopping for an electric vehicle, right? <laughs> Did you see true. any it Mercedes was, out there? Well, it was actually in a slightly different price bracket, but yes, I was, and 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 it was a deeply frustrating experience. Just to throw that into the mix, Benny. Yeah, you have to look very hard to find to find an electrified Mercedes. It's really not been their focus, and it's something that people are sort of concerned about, wondering, are they too late to the party? Volkswagen has very aggressively uh, pushed into that niche, and Daimler today, as I said, they've, they've come out with a fairly aggressive uh, sort of roadmap, saying 20 new cars in a couple of years. But the question really is, will the market have been sort of reallocated? Tesla pushing very aggressively into that market. Uh, we know that they want For to come years. up with a factory. Yep. And, and they now are building a factory outside Berlin. At least that's the plan. And, you know, just one short look at the stock performance of these two companies and you get a sense of where the industry is headed. Daimler is the worst performing stock on the on the DAX this year. Not down a lot, 12%, but still they are the worst. And Tesla, as we all know, have had an amazing start to the year, up more than 80%. So you can sort of buy, just look at those numbers and look at the job cuts that Daimler's facing, look at the dividend cut. So the bottom line is this is a difficult story for Daimler right now. It'll be interesting to see how the CEO tells that story. I, I understand, Matt, you're talking to him yep. later. Yep. This is a new CEO and um, you know he, he has a lot of questions to answer. Com coming from AMG, uh, so I'm excited to talk to him for a couple of different reasons. Benny, thanks so much for joining us. Benedict Camel, they are joining us out of Berlin. I will be interviewing Ola Kalenius in just two hours' time. This is Bloomberg. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. 
TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. The 2020 NBA All-Star Game is live on TuneIn Premium. Catch every fast break, fadeaway, and alley-oop as Team LeBron and Team Giannis go head-to-head in Chicago. Deep three, and in! Oh, man! Five to shoot, LeBron long three, good! Which star will shine the brightest? Who will be named this year's MVP? Find out Sunday at 8 Eastern with ESPN Radio's live coverage of the NBA All-Star Game on TuneIn. Search premium to upgrade today. Financial capital of the world. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Burger Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak for Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. Coming up this hour. Voters head to the polls in New Hampshire as signs point to Bernie Sanders leading the race. The coronavirus death toll passes 1,000 while new cases of the illness appear to be slowing. And Jerome Powell heads to Capitol Hill as questions about the illness weigh on Fed policy. The New Hampshire primary has another wild card, independent voters. I'm John Tucker. The story straight ahead. I'm John Stash. Shower in sports, a thrilling one-point win for the Nets at Indiana. The Islanders won in Washington, and Mets pitchers and catchers have reported into spring training. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak. On Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good morning, I'm Karen Moscow. And I'm Nathan Hager. Bloomberg Daybreak brought to you by SEI. Asset managers can exceed new thresholds for data management, reporting, and responsiveness. Transform your business with SEI's global operating platform at SEIC.com slash IMS. And U.S. futures are building on yesterday's record close for the S&P 500. It is 5.01 on Wall Street. I would check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 7 points. Dow futures up 62. NASDAQ futures up 33. The DAX in Germany is up 7 tenths percent. So is the FTSE 100 and the CAC in Paris up half percent. Ten-year Treasury down 4.30 seconds. Yield 1.58 percent. Yield on the two-year 1.40 percent. NYMEX crude oil is up 1.5 percent or 70 Two cents at fifty dollars twenty nine cents a barrel. Comex Gold is down half percent, or seven dollars sixty cents at fifteen seventy one ninety an ounce. The euro one point oh nine one two against the dollar, and the yen one oh nine point eight seven. Nathan and Karen, we begin with today's primary in New Hampshire. As the vote gets underway, polls show Bernie Sanders poised to win in the Granite State. Let's get the latest from New Hampshire with Bloomberg TV and Radio Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli. The race remains incredibly fluid. The Monmouth University poll last week had four. 49% of the electorate still making up their mind. I've got my eye on Senator Amy Klobuchar. She seems to have some momentum. The question now becomes whether or not the other candidates who have sharpened their attacks against former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, whether that will stunt some of his momentum that we've seen. Senator Bernie Sanders, according to the Boston Globe poll, still very much in the front runner status. So right now it still appears to be Bernie Sanders' New Hampshire primary to lose. In addition to that Boston Globe poll, surveys from you Mass Lowell, CNN, Monmouth, NBC, and Marist all show Bernie Sanders in the lead, followed by some combination of Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, and Joe Biden. Still experts warn anything can happen. Chris Galdieri is a political science professor at St. Anselm College. If Bernie Sanders wins by 10 points, I think that's a great benefit to his campaign. I think that helps him in a way that Iowa didn't. On the other hand, if somebody like you know Warren or Klobuchar surges into second or even a very close third, I think that upends our understanding of the race the same way that Iowa did. 
and we'll bring you special live coverage of the New Hampshire primary results tonight on Bloomberg Radio and Television starting at 7 p.m. Wall Street time. Meantime, in Asia, concerns over the coronavirus continue to weigh on the region. The death toll from the outbreak has now topped 1,000. Infections have climbed past 42,000, though the rate of new cases appears to be slowing. We get the very latest from Bloomberg's Selena Wang in Beijing. Well, the number of new cases has started to stabilize, but as you mentioned, the death toll continues to increase. But according to the World Health Organization, it's optimistic, it's a good sign that these numbers are stabilizing, but it's still too early to conclude whether or not containment has worked. And criticism continues over China's speed in handling the epidemic, and that has Hubei province, the center of the outbreak, removing two health officials from their posts. In Hong Kong, a new case of the virus in a public housing unit is raising questions about the spread of the disease. We get details now from Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann in Hong Kong. They will continue to inspect and disinfect this public housing estate where we found two confirmed cases of the coronavirus. This was a 62-year-old woman who contracted the disease and she lived directly below a man who also tested positive earlier. So there is a concern now that this was transmitted in a different way, perhaps via feces, as they say. They were talking about the plumbing situation there. And now there's a concern that they are also looking at whether this virus is airborne in any way. The woman who contracted the illness lives some 10 floors away from the other patient. Residents of that apartment building have been evacuated as a precautionary measure. Now, as the spread of new cases appears to be slowing down, stocks in Asia posted solid gains in today's session. Bloomberg's Juliet Sally joins us from Singapore now with details. Good morning, Juliet. Good morning, Nathan and Karen. Markets in Hong Kong, Sydney and Seoul rose. While the CSI 300 on the Chinese mainland notched up a sixth session of gains, Japanese markets were shut for a holiday. The Chinese yuan traded offshore maintained its gains while the yen was little changed. In Singapore, I'm Juliet Sali, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Juliet, thank you. The coronavirus will surely come up when Jerome Powell speaks on Capitol Hill today when the Fed chairman delivers his semi-annual monetary policy report to the House Financial Services Committee. Tobias Lefkovich is chief U.S. equity strategist at Citigroup. I think he's going to continue to say what he's been saying for a long time, which is, you know, the Fed is data dependent. They're there to support the economy if necessary as part of their charter. I don't think he's going to stick his neck out too far because he just doesn't know. None of us really know the extent of the problems. So it's going to be kind of standard status quo. We're on the lookout, but I don't think he has any more insight to this than you and I do. And Chairman Powell begins his remarks to Congress around 10 a.m. Wall Street time. We'll bring that to you live on Bloomberg Radio and Television. And on the corporate front, T-Mobile appears poised to finally win approval for its long-awaited takeover of Sprint. Joining us now with details is Bloomberg's Tom Busby. Good morning, Tom. Well, good morning, Nathan and Karen. Bloomberg News has learned a judge in Manhattan is expected to approve the deal as soon as today. A source tells us the judge informed T-Mobile and Sprint of the decision yesterday, nearly two years after the companies announced the $26 billion dollar deal. The combined company will operate under the T-Mobile brand and have a monthly subscriber base of about 80 million, putting it in the same league as AT&T. In New York, I'm Tom Busby, Bloomberg Daybreak. And Tom that has shares of Sprint currently up more than 60% in early trading. And in economic news out of Europe, the U.K. economy narrowly avoided a contraction in the fourth quarter. Gross domestic product was unchanged from the third quarter. The data add to evidence of a pickup following Boris Johnson's election win in December. Again, futures this morning are higher with S&P futures up six points, Dow futures up 58, and Nasdaq futures up 32. Straight ahead, the latest world and national news, and this is Bloomberg. Okay, Karen, thanks. It's 5.07 on Wall Street, and John Tucker is here with more on what's going on around the world. Good morning, John. And good morning, Nathan. As if the Democratic presidential process were complicated enough, the New Hampshire primary today is going to have another wild card, independent voters. Unaffiliated voters make up 42% of the registered voters in the Granite State. That's a larger block than either Democrats or Republicans. In the meantime, Democratic presidential hopeful Pete Buttigieg made his final pass to New Hampshire primary voters last night in Exeter. New Hampshire, I believe you will help make me the next president of the United States. And when you do, I will work every day to make you proud and earn that support. Senator Amy Klobuchar called on New Hampshire voters to surprise the nation by supporting her in today's primary. I know we've got something going on here. That's pretty obvious. But we've got to take it. We have got to take it to the finish line and take it to the country. 
And the Democratic presidential race has taken on new shape as New Hampshire primary gets underway. A Quinnipiac University poll now shows Bernie Sanders overtaking Joe Biden in first place. And Michael Bloomberg surging to third place on a wave of advertising. Michael Bloomberg is the founder majority owner of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg Radio. The Senate will take up a resolution this week intended to rein in President Trump's ability to attack Iran without congressional authorization. The story in this report from Bloomberg's Ed Baxter. As Democrats and a small group of Republican senators push back following the killing in January of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, Senator Mike Lee says this is not about bucking the president. This is about making sure the process works as the Constitution requires. The GOP support will provide the 51 votes needed for the Senate to pass the resolution. The House passed a similar measure in January, but it would need to pass this one for it to go to Trump's desk. The president is likely to veto it, and the Senate lacks the votes to override. So we'll just have to watch and listen. In San Francisco, I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Daybreak. According to a new report, after reviewing 11 years of published scientific studies, the Food and Drug Administration remains convinced there's no obvious health risk posed by exposure to radio waves from mobile phones. The finding coincides with a global expansion of next generation or 5G networks, which has reawakened decades-old fears that radio frequency radiation poses a health threat. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, John, thanks. Coming up to 510 on Wall Street, time for the Bloomberg NBC Sports Update with John Stashar. Nathan, interesting offseason for the Mets. They fired Mickey Calloway, replaced him with Carlos Beltran, and then fired him. So it's Luis Rojas who welcomed in Met pitchers and catchers yesterday at Port St. Lucie with Jacob Grom, Pete Alonso. There are certainly reasons to like the Mets' chances this season. A key could be the health of UN Cespedes, who missed all of last season. Yankee pitchers and catchers will report tomorrow. Much needed win for the Nets. They had been struggling on the road. The Pacers came in having lost five straight. The game went down to the wire. They get it at Dinwoody up top. Seven seconds to go. One on one with Brogdon. Steps right. 20 footer is scored. With 3.8 seconds to go, Brooklyn takes the lead. Nets Radio had it. That the difference in a 106-105 victory. Dinwiddie finishing with 21 points and 11 assists. Joe Harris hit big shots down the stretch as well. The Nets get the victory on the road. The Islanders do as well. Here's Bailey off the steal and a save from Samsonov. Taves to the net. It was tipped. The rebound. Two chances. Another one. They score. Anthony Beauvillier. Twice in the opening 6-16. MSG, the call there. Islanders went up 5-1, to one, held on, beat the league-leading Capitals 5-3. to three. Phillip Rivers is a free agent. going to be interesting in NFL offseason with the future of Tom Brady in doubt. Drew Brees unsigned, and it's now certain that Rivers will not return to the Chargers the team he has spent his entire career with. For the Bloomberg NBC Sports Update, I'm John Stanfield. Nathan? All right, John, thanks. And soon you could own a piece of one of the most controversial baseball games in history. Heritage Auctions is selling items from the 1983 Pine Tar game between the Yankees and Royals. The one where Royals star George Brett hit what appeared to be a game-winning home run, only to have it reversed because he had too much Pine Tar on his bat. The highlight of this auction will be Brett's jersey. It's expected to fetch more than $100,000. Futures pointing to a higher open this morning. This is Bloomberg. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Imagine. Imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion or your race or because you have children or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. 
Which of us has the power? The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit HUD.gov slash fair housing. That's HUD.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. What? Coming soon, Ricochet, the new action film written by, directed, and starring Euro Millions winner, Timothy Barker, with music by Timothy Barker. Tonight's Euro Millions jackpot is a massive £14 million. That's dream come true money. Euro Millions from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Estimated jackpot. Rules and procedures apply. Plays must be 16 or over. There's just three days to go until Valentine's Day. So head to your local Asda in London. We've got bouquets from £5. Gifts they'll adore at prices you'll love. Don't compromise. Asda. Save money, live better. Selected stores subject to availability. Available from 12th of February. Hey, have you heard? The Mayor of London has launched his latest van scrappage scheme to help tackle London's toxic air. Small businesses or sole traders like me with a polluting van could now get £7,000, which you could use to trade up to a Euro 6 vehicle. And you could get an extra £2,500 towards running costs if you go electric. The scheme is now even easier to qualify for, and it's open to any businesses with up to 50 employees, like mine. So, I'm going to search TfL Scrappage to see if I'm eligible and apply. You should do the same. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, work from home on a Friday jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, Soho jobs, Shoreditch jobs, keep me away from the central line jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, never ever boring jobs, small jobs, big jobs, lunch in borough market jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. Here's Francine Lacroix. Joining us actually is Fiona Frick from Unigestion. Fiona, when you look at uh, the coronavirus, how do you view it from a market perspective? It's interesting because macro news were, were quite good. Central bank have shown that they are there. It can be the US central bank, the European central bank, or even the China central bank, and inflation is nowhere. So on an economical front, if you look, it's quite good, but the problem is it's backward looking. And then there you have this uh, coronavirus, which has two impacts. First, on demand on China. China, which could have an influence on global demand and therefore on global growth and uh, therefore to, also output. But to a point where actually we could hear, we could see the, the seeds of a possible recession, Fiona, or, or not so much? So is it slowing growth? For the moment, we see slowing growth. And the problem is with the coronavirus and, and it's... So, and with the response that China has done, which is incredibly powerful of quarantine all these people, uh, the impact it can have on consumption uh, and on output for some global companies can be quite important. So the question is, how long will it last? And uh, so it's more of a wild card today for us that we are looking at, but we keep our positioning, which is still positive on the macro side because growth is still there in the U.S., not brilliant in Europe, uh, no inflation and accommodative central banks, which will be ready to step in if there is a problem. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings, markets, headlines, and breaking news. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. Stocks are climbing in Europe and Asia, and U.S. stock index futures edging higher as investors push global equity benchmarks to record highs before commentary from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Oil is advancing. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 7.5 points. Dow futures up 68. NASDAQ futures up 36. 
The DAX in Germany is up seven tenths percent. Ten-year Treasury down five thirty seconds, yield one point five eight percent. They yield on the two-year one point four one percent. NYMEX crude oil up one and a quarter percent, or sixty three cents at fifty dollars twenty cents a barrel. COMEX gold is down half percent, or seven dollars ninety cents at fifteen seventy one fifty an ounce. The euro one point oh nine one three against the dollar. British pound one point two nine three one, and the yen is at one oh nine point eight six. And today we are watching for a report on small business optimism out at six o'clock Wall Street time. At 10, it's the Jolts Jobs Report, and Under Armour and Akamai Technologies among companies scheduled to report earnings today. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here's John Tucker with more on what's going on around the world. John, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Karen. The death toll from the coronavirus has exceeded 1,000. Hubei, the province at the center of the outbreak in China, reporting its highest number of fatalities yet. They also removed top officials. Senator Bernie Sanders is favored to win today's New Hampshire primary, holding a solid lead. A new national poll shows Sanders overtaking Joe Biden in first place and Michael Bloomberg surging to third place on a wave of advertising. The Quinnipiac University survey is the first national survey since the Iowa caucuses. Michael Bloomberg, who's seeking the presidential nomination, is the founder majority owner of Bloomberg LP, parent company of Bloomberg Radio. In sports basketball, the Nets beat the Pacers while the Warriors lose to Miami. On the ice, the Islanders beat the Capitals and the Sharks fall to the Flames. Global News 24 hours a day, on the air, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Nathan. Okay, John, thanks. It's 519 on Wall Street. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak. And we're joined now by Kevin Cummins, economist at NatWest Market Securities, as we await uh, Chairman Powell's testimony before the House Financial Services Committee, kicking off uh, two days of uh, comments on Capitol Hill. Kevin, good morning. Obviously, the coronavirus has been an overriding concern for the markets for weeks now. What more clarity do you expect to hear from the chairman uh, on Capitol Hill today, given that the monetary policy report calls it a new risk to the U.S. outlook? Yeah, that's right. I think that was uh, the characterization that the Fed in, published just last Friday in the monetary policy report that's going to that he's Powell is going to be testifying on. Um, given that the overall economic impact from the virus is going to depend on how long it eventually takes to restrain the ec- epidemic, and then how long it takes to resume economic activity, it's unlikely that Powell can really add all that much today. Um, you know, he'll emphasize that they're watching the situation very closely and that it's a downside risk to the overall global economy um, and, and, and kind of reiterate what he said at his January 29th uh, testimony. Um, as of then, he sounded fairly, I think he used the word cautiously optimistic about the outlook for the global economy. So we'll see if his uh, tone changes at all and if he seems a little bit more worried about it, uh, about possible spillovers for the U.S. But that's really what markets are watching for today. How much spillover do you see the coronavirus uh, causing in the U.S.? Has there been uh, enough information coming out from China about its impact? Yeah, no, not not yet. I mean, we'll have to see. It's going to take time. First off, we have to see how long it takes to restrain the epidemic, as I mentioned. And then it's going to take to, to how long before we can see some resumption in economic activity. I think ultimately the economic impact, um, we, 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 there's no way to confidently estimate until we see you know, the timelines on when a lot of these contingency efforts, whether it's factory shutdowns or halting business travel, if they're proving worthwhile, and and then eventually they're going to be eliminated. We'll be able to, at that point, see how quickly things can resume on, on the activity side. Do the uncertainties around the coronavirus change your view on whether the Fed uh, alters its policy, uh, adds more easing this year? Um, well, coming into the 2020, we at NatWest Markets were already calling for the Fed to uh, ease rates this year twice. Um, so we were 
amongst, uh, I guess, some of the more aggressive forecasters looking for the Fed to cut rates again. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of risks with the global trade situation, uh, then the uncertainty with regard to the presidential election. There's two very different candidates. We'll have to see who gets the Democratic nominee. Uh, but, you know, for the time being, it's very unlikely that we see any sort of uh, pickup in business investment. Uh, consumption has started to show signs of moderating, and then this coronavirus adds some downside risk to the outlook. So I think the Fed, uh, you know, is going to be easing this year. The timing of it is probably not so a little bit later than we initially thought, um, but this certainly adds some downside risk to that. And uh, the Fed, you know, is, is in our view, uh, with the kind of the economy growing at or perhaps below trend, with the inflation backdrop as weak as it is, that they're going to be taking some insurance out again this year. Uh, not only does the chairman testify over the next couple of days, uh, President Trump's picks for uh, the Federal Reserve Board go up for confirmation hearings later on this week. In our last minute, what's your view on Judy Shelton and Christopher Waller? Yeah, uh, certainly. Christopher Waller is uh, an accomplished uh, economist at the, from the St. Louis Fed, so I think he probably will get through the process. Um, I would put him in certainly one of the more dovish uh, uh, purviews of, of what's likely to be on the committee itself. Um, he's very close to uh, St. Louis said President Bullard, who also was, uh, he was his research director, so I wouldn't be surprised that he has a pretty um, uh, 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 dovish outlook on monetary policy going forward. Um, Judy Shelton, I think, is probably going to struggle to get uh, the nomination from from the Congress. Um, she's certainly seemed as someone a little bit more politically tied to the president, um, and uh, she's been very critical of the Fed. So she's going to probably have a little bit more difficulty trying to get through. Kevin Cummins, always good getting your insights. Thanks for being with us this morning. Kevin Cummins is an economist at NatWest Market Securities. And a reminder, Chairman Powell begins his two days of testimony on Capitol Hill before the House Financial Services Committee uh, right around 10 a.m. Wall Street time. Uh, we will bring you the chairman's remarks live on Bloomberg Radio and television. Futures pointing to a higher open this morning on Wall Street. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. We could hear as early as this morning that a Manhattan federal court has signed off on T-Mobile's takeover of Sprint. Bloomberg has learned that the judge has told both companies that he is ruling in their favor over a state-led lawsuit aimed at blocking the deal. This was the last major obstacle to the merger. After reviewing 11 years of scientific studies, the FDA says it's convinced there's no obvious health risk posed by exposure to radio waves from our mobile phones. But the report stopped short of a 100% conclusion and urges more research on live animals and people. Apple's main production partner has restarted some work at its main iPhone-making site in China after being shuttered because of the coronavirus. Local officials reported the partial ramp-up for Foxconn, but it was not clear how many workers had returned. U.S. stocks are headed for a higher open with the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq starting out at record highs today. Fed Chair Jay Powell speaks at Congress today. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at babble.com slash terms. Please don't test and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64... Rita's rowdy enchiladas. Every time the kids are together, it's always the same. Never a moment's peace. Didn't take me long to work out the trick, though. Shredded chicken and black bean enchiladas with lime, oregano... And my little secret, a bit of smoke and spice with chipotle paste. 
hear that? Never failed yet. Make your own rowdy enchiladas with Tesco British Chicken. Food Love Stories, brought to you by Tesco. Ah, good book. Mmm, refreshing drink. Six degrees outside. 35 in here. <laughs> this really is the life. Could the gentleman in oil toe please remove himself from the hot tub? Oh, so much for try before you buy. Well, at Ford, you can. Test drive and purchase any new Ford car or commercial vehicle this February and we'll give you an additional £500 off the recommended retail price. Search Ford Test Drive Promotion. Retail and small business customers only. Contract and register by 29th of February 2020 at participating Ford dealers. Excludes Ford scrappage. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone. So you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Could you leave it with my neighbour, please? Sure, no problem. And it's so simple, you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. One of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you. Sign up to Walk All Over Cancer with Cancer Research UK. Walk 10,000 steps every day in March and together we will beat cancer. Are you ready, Boots? It's a sunny day, perfect for walking. Start walking. Use the 10,000 Steps a Day Challenge to team up and bring friends and family together to help beat cancer. Come on, search Walk All Over Cancer and sign up now. Good morning, this is your southern service to London, Victoria. Join in our onboard quiz. Here's our next clue. What C sounds like a handheld party food but keeps you dry and protected from the rain? Not canapes, canopies. At Southern Railway, we're investing over £7 million into making improvements for you, like canopies, cycle parking and new platform lighting across more of our stations. Find out more and book your tickets at southernrailway.com. Southern Railway, we're with you. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit tunein.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. And it's 5.30 on Wall Street. Good morning, I'm Karen Moscow. I'm Nathan Hager. Bloomberg Daybreak brought to you by Stevens Institute of Technology, ranked highest in the New York metro area for online graduate business programs by U.S. News & World Report. A Stevens graduate finance degree will position you for what's next. Stevens.edu slash finance. And we're just about four hours away from the opening of U.S. trading. Let's get you up to date on the news you need to know at this hour. U.S. futures are building on yesterday's record close for the S&P 500. In Asia, there's optimism that coronavirus is being contained. New cases appear to be slowing despite a fresh death toll above 1,000. We get the very latest from Bloomberg Daybreak Asia anchor Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. 2,097 new infections, but the smallest increase since February 1st. That stoked a big rally in stocks as investors clamor for a peak in infections. Also, state media said Hubei removed two officials, including the party chief. That goes to accountability. But a worrisome development here in Hong Kong. Two infections in the same apartment, some 10 floors apart. That raises fears about the mode of infection. And more than 100 people were evacuated. In Hong Kong, Brian Curtis, Bloomberg Daybreak. Thank you, Brian. Meantime, billionaire Ray Dalio says the impact of the outbreak on markets has been exaggerated and is likely to be short-lived. The founder of Bridgewater Associates made those comments at a conference in Abu Dhabi. We may get more clues on the Fed's response to the virus when Chairman Jerome Powell delivers the first of two days of congressional testimony today. Here's economist Dennis Gartman. I would like to hear him say that this is going to be deleterious to the global economy and detrimental to the U.S. economy. He won't be able to say exactly how much. But to avoid any comment would be uh, silly. He won't do that. I have great respect for Chairman Powell, and I think he'll comment upon what's happening in China and say we're, we're monitoring it as best we might. Clearly, it's going to be detrimental. We'll do what we can. 
And Powell speaks before the House Financial Services Committee at 10 a.m. in Washington. We'll bring that to you live on Blue, on both Bloomberg Radio and Television. In Europe, the U.K. economy narrowly avoided a contraction in the fourth quarter. Gross domestic product was unchanged from the third quarter. And turning to corporate news now, shares of Sprint are up more than 60% in early trading. Bloomberg News has learned T-Mobile is poised to win court approval for its $26 billion takeover of Sprint, defeating a lawsuit that sought to block the deal. Now let's get you up to date on how stocks are faring. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 8 points this morning. Dow futures up 75. NASDAQ futures up 37. The DAX in Germany is up 7 tenths percent. Ten-year Treasury down 6 30 seconds. Yield 1.59%. And IMAX crude oil is up one and a third percent at fifty dollars twenty four cents a barrel. Straight ahead, we have the latest world and national news, and this is Bloomberg. Okay, thank you, Karen. It's thirty three on Wall Street. Now let's get a check of what's going on around the world with Bloomberg's John Tucker. Good morning, John. Hey, good morning, Nathan. New Hampshire's first in the nation presidential primary is underway. Bloomberg's Bob Moon has an update on where the top candidates stand nationally among Democrats and Democratic-leaning independent voters heading into this closely watched contest. The Democrats vying for the chance to recapture the White House know well what's riding on this day. It could begin the end of Donald Trump. Fresh polling suggests he's the man of the moment. The latest Quinnipiac University national poll puts Bernie Sanders in the lead with 25 percent of support. Joe Biden has climbed back up to second with 17 percent, while Michael Bloomberg, founder and majority shareholder of Bloomberg LP, parent company of Bloomberg News, has 15 percent, though he's not competing in New Hampshire. Elizabeth Warren's fourth place position may explain this primary eve vow that foremost is beating Donald Trump. Whoever our Democratic nominee is, I'm in 100%. Bloomberg Radio's live primary coverage starts tonight at 7 New Hampshire time. Bob Moon, Bloomberg Daybreak. President Trump campaigning in Manchester, New Hampshire, Monday night suggested we really don't know which Democrat won the Iowa caucuses. He also implied that Bernie Sanders was treated unfairly in 2016 and that it's happening again. Democrats are now the party of high taxes, high crime open borders, late-term abortion, socialism, and blatant corruption. The Republican Party is the party of the American worker, the American family. The Philippines has uh, notified the United States of its intent to terminate a major security pact allowing American forces to train in that country. It's the most serious threat to the country's treaty alliance uh, to President Rodrigo Duterte. Duterte has often criticized U.S. security policies despite the Philippine military's close historic ties with its American counterpart. A long-delayed project to build a new rail bridge between Newark, New Jersey and New York, known as the Portal Draw Bridge, has received an upgrade from federal transportation officials that will qualify for key federal funding. The new ratings were released late Monday as part of President Trump's budget proposal. A larger project to build a new rail tunnel into New York remains stalled as federal officials give it a low rating over a funding dispute. In a court filing yesterday, U.S. prosecutors told a judge that longtime Republican operative Roger Stone deserves to spend as long as nine years in prison for lying to Congress to protect President Trump and other crimes. Stone is due to be sentenced by U.S. District Judge Amy Berman Jackson at Washington on February 20th. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Nathan. Okay, John, thanks. Coming up to 536 on Wall Street. Time for the Bloomberg NBC Sports Update. Here's John Stashup. Nathan, Mets pitchers and catchers reported to spring training in Port St. Lucie with a manager they until recently didn't think they'd have, but Luis Rojas replaced Carlos Beltran. He was with the Mets last season, and players like Steven Matz go even further back with him. 2013, we won a South Carolina League championship, and so that's a that's a pretty hard thing to do, you know, go through the minor league season together and, you know, win that, win that championship. So I have great memories with him. That was a really fun season. I learned a lot that year. It was a big step to, uh, to my career as well. Yankee pitchers and catchers report in Tampa tomorrow. Thrilling win for the Nets at Indiana, 106-105 on a Spencer Dinwiddie jumper with three seconds left. The Pacers' sixth straight loss. The Islanders won 5-3 at Washington. 
Two early goals for Anthony Bouvillier, two in the first seven minutes. No goals for Alex Ovechkin. He still needs two for 700 in his career. Rare loss for the Caps. It's their 15th all season in regulation. College basketball. Duke was coming off that incredible overtime win Saturday night at North Carolina. Another big victory for the Blue Devils, this time at home. 70-65 to over Florida State in a battle of top 10 teams. Baylor is number one. Showed why. 52-45 to at Texas. And Baylor has now won 21 games in a row. South Carolina is number one in women's basketball. Last night blew out UConn by 18 in atypical season for the Huskies. Already three losses. With the Bloomberg NBC Sports Update, I'm John Stashauer. Nathan? All right, John, thanks. It's 537 on Wall Street, and the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week is on newsstands now with the cover on the economic impact from the coronavirus outbreak. Also in this week's issue, how the Iowa caucuses muddied the waters for today's New Hampshire primary. Joshua Green wrote the story for Bloomberg Business Week. Essentially, the Iowa caucus settled nothing at all, and now the whole party moves on to New Hampshire. Read more about this and other stories in this week's edition of Bloomberg Business Week on newsstands now and online at businessweek.com. And terminal customers can receive a complimentary subscription at MAG Go. Listen to Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly right here on Bloomberg Radio or watch it on YouTube weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. Wall Street time. Get global business, finance, and tech news on your TV, computer, or mobile device. Just head to YouTube.com and search Bloomberg Global News. 538 on Wall Street. It's time for the Tri State Business Report. Here's Bloomberg's Ed Corey. Good morning, Ed. Hi, Nathan. Just days after New York's real estate industry reacted with shock to a state ban on broker fees, a judge has temporarily blocked the new rule. The decision puts the new regulation on ice until at least next month. For tenants, it could mean a return of a costly fee that's been paid grudgingly for decades by renters in New York City. Well, last month, the New Jersey legislature introduced the New Jersey Fair Work Week Act. If it's passed, the state would become the second to adopt a statewide predictable scheduling law. Employers and employees would have to exchange information about availability and expectations about their hours and their shifts. Subway's latest round of layoffs has reportedly prompted a job fair in the town where it's based. The restaurant chain dismissed 300 people at its head office in Milford, Connecticut, representing about a quarter of its staff. That's your Bloomberg Tri-State Business Report. I'm Ed Corey. Nathan? Thanks, Ed. 530. On Wall Street, Bloomberg Radio is on the air from San Francisco to New York, London to Hong Kong. Let's check in with our global news team for some of the top stories heard on our 300 affiliate radio stations around the world. I'm Courtney Dunahoe on KRLD in Dallas. Exxon is cracking down on employee travel budgets after posting its worst quarterly profit in years. I'm Roger Hearing on Bloomberg DAB Digital Radio in London, we're reporting on Sajid Javid's pledge to diverge from EU rules on financial services. I'm Steve Potos, got on 1010 wins in New York. We're talking about T Mobile reportedly poised to win court approval of its merger with Sprint. I'm Ed Corey on WOAI in San Antonio. I'm reporting Morgan Stanley has cut its 2020 oil demand growth forecast by 15%. And those are some of the stories. Our 2,700 Bloomberg journalists and analysts are working on this morning around the world. A couple other stories we're watching. Boeing says it'll take several quarters to return the grounded 737 MAX to the skies. The company's marketing vice president tells Bloomberg they're not going to overstress the system. Boeing still hopes to get that jet flying by mid-year. And Intel has joined the list of big tech firms pulling out of the wireless industry's biggest conference due to concerns over the coronavirus. Intel joins Ericsson, Sony, and LG in withdrawing from the Mobile World Congress, which gets underway February 24th in Barcelona. Before trading gets underway on Wall Street, futures are pointing to a higher open. This is Bloomberg. Rich Please, to... is just a really, oh, really, really good guy. The term good egg isn't enough to describe him. He's also certified organic and free range. Rich puts the cap back on everything. The toothpaste, the olive oil, the shampoo, everything. He lets his 10-year-old nephew beat him at virtual tennis, even though he can straight up slay his 10-year-old nephew in virtual tennis. When the toilet paper is running low, Rich replaces the roll on the actual holder, not just on the back of the toilet. Rich is texting and driving. Rich, no. What are you doing, Rich? I was just telling everyone how great you are. Texting and driving makes good people look bad. 
Visit StopTextStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their business strategically. Yet, the most competitive managers in the market know, with the right partner and a flexible operating platform, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, President of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, we understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best in class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at SEIC.com slash seize change. This is your... There's just three days to go until Valentine's Day. So head to your local Asda in London. Get a mini plush bear for just one pound. Get Valentine's Day sorted in a heartbeat. Gibbs the door at prices you'll love. Don't compromise. Asda. Save money, live better. Selected stores subject to availability. Despite never having used them, Alison Peartree was not initially a fan of purple bricks. Because I heard from my uncle's cousin's neighbour's dog walker they don't have proper estate agents. But Alison's uncle's cousin's neighbour's dog walker was wrong. Purple Bricks have experienced local agents ready to sell your home. Turns out Martin from Purple Bricks was very knowledgeable. And he didn't charge commission. I've even recommended him to my sister's boyfriend's auntie's hairdresser, Sharon. Purple Bricks. Book your free valuation today. Fixed fee payable on instruction or after 10 months. Viewing service cost extra. Where are we? The New Forest. But I thought we only had the mini countryman booked for a test drive. We can't stay here. We're not going to. This isn't exactly what I meant. Relax. With Mini's new 48-hour test drive, you can use the countryman for exactly what it's built for. Exploring. Plus, it's an SUV, the largest Mini in the range, so you can pack loads more in. Great. Where next? Well, you know how you've always wanted to try kayaking? The Mini Countryman 48-hour test drive. Visit mini.co.uk to book yours. Mini. Who's in? Test drive subject to status and availability. Terms and conditions apply. Participating Mini retailers only. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. Sign up to Walk All Over Cancer with Cancer Research UK. Walk 10,000 steps every day in March and help raise money for life-saving research. Are you ready, boots? It's a sunny day. Perfect for walking. Start walking. Use the 10,000 Steps a Day Challenge to team up and bring friends and family together to help beat cancer. Come on, search Walk All Over Cancer and sign up now. Peoples of London, are you like Sergei, working your paws off from 9 to 5, then cooking for whole family? Well, I, Alexander, have taken the responsibility for tonight's splendid evening meal. Ooh, let me guess, meerkat meals? Of course, <laughs> you know how I roll. Get two phone on food with meerkat meals at your local favorites, like Spice Island, when you buy through Compares the Market. Qualifying purchase app only, two for one on selected food, participating restaurants, a la carte only, Sunday to Thursday, T's and season exclusions apply. Global news, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok on Twitter. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Radio. Now, a global news update. President Trump last night at a campaign rally in New Hampshire. They're all fighting each other. They're all going after each other. You got them all over the place. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They can't even count their votes. Bernie Sanders holds on to his lead in Democratic polling. The Vermont senator campaigning yesterday in New Hampshire didn't hold back in his description of President Trump. A pathological liar who is running a corrupt administration who is a bully and a vindictive person, who is a racist, a sexist, a xenophobe, a homophobe, and a religious bigot. And those are his nice qualities. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has won the votes in the community of Dixville Notch, New Hampshire, where five residents cast their ballots just after the stroke of midnight. I'm John Trout. Tom Keen and Jonathan Farrell. 
Is that good for American finance? What is happening with the headcount? Right, where it counts. Bloomberg Surveillance, weekday mornings at 7 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. Stocks are climbing in Europe and Asia, and U.S. stock index futures are edging higher as investors push global equity benchmarks to record highs before commentary from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up nine points. Dow futures up 79. NASDAQ futures up 41. The DAX in Germany is up about eight-tenths of a percent. Ten-year Treasury down 6.30 seconds. Yield 1.59 percent. Yield on the two-year 1.41 percent. NYMEX crude oil is up 1.5% or 73 cents at $50.30 a barrel. COMEX gold is down half percent or $8.50 at fifteen seventy one an ounce. The euro, 1.0916 against the dollar. British pound, 1.2921. And the yen at 109.89. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here's John Tucker with more on what's going on around the world. John. And good morning, Karen. The coronavirus death toll has risen above 1,000. President Trump says he believes warm weather will curb the spread of the disease and the u.s reported a 13th infection this one in california and bernie sanders favored to win the new hampshire primary today holding a solid lead in the latest polls and the justice department filing suit against new jersey and the county that's home to the city of seattle over so-called sanctuary policies sports in basketball the nets beat the pacers while the warriors lose to miami and on the ice the islanders beat the capitals the sharks fall to the flames global news 24 hours today on air and a quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Nathan. Okay, John, thanks. It's 548 on Wall Street, and we are live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios on this New Hampshire primary day. Bloomberg Radio and Television Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli is with us now live from Manchester with uh, some of the voting already underway, yeah. Kevin. Good morning. Uh, good morning. How, how is the uh, voting going so far? Well, look, I think one of the big questions that we're going to be looking out for is, is where does turnout stand? You know, uh, President Trump packed a huge rally in the stadium across the street from where I am located in downtown Manchester. But early voting would indicate, if you look at the polls, it would uh, not early voting, if you look at the polls, it would indicate that this is really a race between Senator Bernie Sanders and former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And uh, there's still a very sizable undecided vote as well, at least showing from the polls. When you factor that in and the potential of uh, President Trump's rally uh, altering uh, turnout in some way, how does that affect what we could see later on this evening? You know, it's a great question because here's the thing about New Hampshire. Here's the thing about the Granite State that makes it different from some of the other primary and caucus states. You have to remember that independent voters can vote in the primary up here. So it's not just Democrats who are voting. Independent voters can vote. And and when I was talking to voters over the last couple of days, so many of them, Nathan, to your point, remain undecided. Now, why is that, I asked them. And they say, well, you know, they, they've been inundated with ads. They've been inundated with all of this information. And many of them actually won't even end up voting. Uh, so there's that element going on. But the broader takeaway, I think, is that they also want to elect a candidate who they feel uh, that the party Party will rally behind, and um, so it's it's been quite interesting to see that dynamic play out. Some of the other uh, storylines and narratives that we're following out of here is who finishes in third place. Will it be Joe Biden? Will he be able to irk out a victory, or will it be an Amy Klobuchar or an Elizabeth Warren? The pressure would be on a Senator Klobuchar for her to continue with her campaign. Should she not get some new life into her campaign heading into the Nevada and uh, South Carolina contests? So. There are some pressure on these candidates because they have to raise money in order to continue forward. How pivotal is this vote, particularly for Elizabeth Warren, given that she is from New England and the polls going forward into the rest of the uh, February states show Joe Biden uh, holding a pretty significant lead? I mean, is this almost a last stand for her? 
I don't know if I would call it a last stand, but but to your point, I totally agree with the premise of your question and that there is a lot of pressure on her. This is someone who has not been able, unlike a Senator Klobuchar, to recapture momentum following the last debate. If you look at Friday's debate performance, Klobuchar had a very strong showing, Nathan. And so for Warren, she's been trying to pitch herself as a unifying candidate, someone who would be able to unite the more progressive and centrist wings of the party. But it just really hasn't been resonating. She hasn't had her moment. She has a ton of cash on hand. Uh, Klobuchar was able to break in big money, big, big money, following her strong showing in the debate on Friday. Uh, but for both of their campaigns and both of their candidacies, you know, where do they go from here? Ditto for Andrew Yang and Tom Steyer. How much does New Hampshire represent momentum in this race, given how different the makeup of the electorate is in the rest of the states going forward? Well, I think it's so that's a, it's a great point. I, when I talk to Democratic strategists, they say that. But we vote. This has always been the process. You know, Iowa, New Hampshire. And there are things that you can read in both of those electorates, just like there are things that you can read in South Carolina electorate and Nevada electorate. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. New Hampshire is one contest along the way. Uh, Joe Biden has said that. He says that he wants he is fully uh, prepared to build out until Super Tuesday. But where it does matter are the three reasons that we've talked about before. One, free earned media and momentum. Two, the ability to fundraise. And finally, last, and, and perhaps one of the most important, is the ability to organize. The ability to tap into your organized structure. And, and the campaigns are really sharpened in their ability to 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 practice really for the other contests and that's something i think that we can't under under uh sell as well bernie sanders has done this before bernie sanders has been here before uh, has the operations in place has had the operations in place for quite some time in just a few seconds here how much pressure is on new hampshire the democratic party itself to be clear about the result uh after the debacle in iowa Oh, I don't even want to think about what would happen yeah. tonight if there's another debacle. Don't do that to me, Nathan. I'll be up late. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of pressure, just like there would be on any party. Uh, for, you know, we, the, the elections have to be fair. Bloomberg Radio and Television Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli with us from New, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, providing some... Uh Sunshine, making sure this race stays clear, and we will bring you special live coverage of the man, of the uh, New Hampshire primary results tonight on Bloomberg Radio and Television. You can uh, start tuning in for that at 7 p.m. Wall Street time. Karen? All right, Nathan, thank you. It is 554 on Wall Street. Time for the Bloomberg Law Brief. Exploring legal issues in the news brought to you by American Arbitration Association. Business disputes are inevitable. Resolve faster with the American Arbitration Association, the global leader in alternative dispute resolution for over 90 years. More at ADR.org. Today we're looking at New York State suing to stop the Trump administration from barring residents from enrolling in federal trusted traveler programs. These are programs like Global Entry, which allows pre-screened participants to breeze through airport, passport, and customs checks. For more on the lawsuit, Bloomberg's June Grasso speaks with Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight. New York says this is retribution for a new state law that allows New York residents to apply for driver's licenses without having to prove that they're in the U.S. legally. But what are the grounds for the lawsuit? Well, there are several grounds for the lawsuit. So there are some very technical grounds that they're hoping they can win on that seem to be quite promising for New York. And then there's the traditional constitutional grounds. So the very technical grounds are that these trusted traveler programs were created under the 2004 Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. What that law says is that the purpose of this is to expedite the travel of previously screened and known travelers and that the goal all of this is to make the program enrollment convenient, easily accessible, and provide applicants with clear and consistent eligibility guidelines. And so the idea is that the statute is being violated by discriminating against one state as opposed to all states treating them the same way. So that's the crux of the lawsuit. And then there are these broader constitutional claims about denying people the ability to get trusted traveler status without due process 
process and the state sovereignty issues that a state should be able to issue driver's licenses without affecting federal policy. And then finally, that the actual new rule should have been passed through notice and comment because it is a rule, it's a substantive rule. And so because they didn't do that, it violates the Administrative Procedure Act. When people enroll in the Trusted Traveler programs, what kind of investigation is done of them? Do they go to the state driver's license records and check them out? No, in fact, that's a fascinating point, which is that a driver's license is not even a conditioned precedent to getting a trusted traveler program, meaning if you've never even entered a car in your entire life, much less drive, that has nothing to do with how you get screened or whether you're eligible for a trusted traveler program, which obviously most of the time has to do with planes. It can have to do with cars in terms of the nexus lanes up in the Canada-U.S. border, but what really happens is you get very through 21 different databases, one called UPAX, one called TEX, one called IDENT, another one from the FBI's National Crime Information Center. And so all of these databases are vetted because you're providing your fingerprints as the applicant for a trusted traveler. With these fingerprints, the federal government now knows exactly who you are and can determine whether to strike you or not strike you based on what those fingerprint searches reveal. And that's Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight, speaking with Bloomberg's June Grosso. Catch more of that interview, plus analysis of the latest legal news by subscribing to the Bloomberg Law Podcast or downloading the show at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. And attorneys can find exceptional legal research and business development tools at BloombergLaw.com. S&P futures are up nine points. Dow futures up 74. NASDAQ futures up about 40. And the 10-year Treasury down 630 seconds yield 1.59%. And Bloomberg Daybreak continues. This is Bloomberg. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, work from home on a Friday jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, Soho jobs, Shoreditch jobs, keep me away from the central line jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, never ever boring jobs, small jobs, big jobs, lunch in borough market jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. It was a Sunday morning when I jumped on the tube and decided to pop down to Greenwich via a large indoor jungle and when I got there I was captivated by a sparkling scary dinosaur just standing there right in front of me so off we went to Wembley Park to look at the colourful fish tap into the wonderful world of off-peak London travel in zones 2 to 6 for £1.50 to the Mayor of London and TfL every journey matters £1.50 is an adult off-peak page you go fare for a journey not going via zone 1 on tube DLR and most London overground services always touching in and out with the same card or device to pay the right fare where are we? The new forest. But I thought we only had the mini countryman booked for a test drive. We can't stay here. We're not going to. This isn't exactly what I meant. Relax. With Mini's new 48-hour test drive, you can use the countryman for exactly what it's built for. Exploring. Plus, it's an SUV, the largest mini in the range, so you can pack loads more in. Great. Where next? Well, you know how you've always wanted to try kayaking? The Mini Countryman 48-hour test drive. Visit mini.co.uk to book yours. Mini. Who's in? Test drive subject to status and availability. Terms and conditions apply. Participating Mini retailers only. The world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Burger Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak for Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. Coming up this hour. Voters head to the polls in New Hampshire as signs point to Bernie Sanders leading the race. The coronavirus death toll passes 1,000 while new cases of the illness appear to be slowing. And Jerome Powell heads to Capitol Hill as questions about the illness weigh on Fed policy. The New Hampshire primary has another wild card, independent voters. I'm John Tucker. The story straight ahead. I'm John Stash. Shower in sports, a thrilling one-point win for the Nets at Indiana. The Islanders won in Washington, and Mets pitchers and catchers have reported to spring training. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak. On Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good morning, 
I'm Karen Moscow. And I'm Nathan Hager. Bloomberg Daybreak brought to you by IBKR, the world of the uh, professional's gateway to the world's markets. Their clients enjoy lowest cost access to stocks, options, futures, forex, and fixed income from a single integrated account. Learn more at IBKR.com. And U.S. futures are building on yesterday's record close for the S&P 500, 601 on Wall Street. And we check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. Right now, S&P futures are up 8 points. Dow futures up 72. NASDAQ futures up 39. The DAX in Germany is up 8 tenths percent. So is the FTSE 100 and the CAC in Paris up half percent. Ten-year Treasury down 5.30 seconds. Yield 1.58 percent. And the yield on the two-year 1.40 percent. NYMEX crude oil up 1.5 percent or 70 three cents at fifty dollars thirty cents a barrel comex gold is down half percent or seven dollars ninety cents at fifteen seventy one sixty an ounce the euro one point oh nine one nine against the dollar the yen at one oh nine point eight six nathan and karen we begin with today's primary in new hampshire as the vote gets underway polls show bernie sanders poised to win in the granite state let's get the latest uh, right now from new hampshire with bloomberg tv and radio chief washington correspondent kevin cirilli the race remains incredibly fluid the monmouth university poll last week had 49% of the electorate still making up their mind. I've got my eye on Senator Amy Klobuchar. She seems to have some momentum. The question now becomes whether or not the other candidates who have sharpened their attacks against former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, whether that will stunt some of his momentum that we've seen. Senator Bernie Sanders, according to the Boston Globe poll, still very much in the front runner status. So right now it still appears to be Bernie Sanders New Hampshire primary to lose. In addition to that Boston Globe poll, sir, Surveys from UMass, Lowell, CNN, Monmouth, NBC, and Marist all show Bernie Sanders in the lead, followed by some combination of Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, and Joe Biden. Still experts warn anything can happen. Chris Galdieri is a political science professor at St. Anselm College. If Bernie Sanders wins by 10 points, I think that's a great benefit to his campaign. I think that helps him in a way that Iowa didn't. On the other hand, if somebody like you know Warren or Klobuchar surges into second or even a very close third, I think that upends our understanding of the race the same way that Iowa did. And we'll bring you special live coverage of the New Hampshire primary results tonight on Bloomberg Radio and Television starting at 7 p.m. Wall Street time. Meantime, in Asia, concerns over the coronavirus continue to weigh on the region. The death toll from the outbreak has now topped 1,000 and infections have climbed past 42,000. Though the rate of new cases appears to be slowing. We get the very latest from Bloomberg's Selena Wang in Beijing. Well, the number of new cases has started to stabilize, but as you mentioned, the death toll continues to increase. But according to the World Health Organization, it's optimistic, it's a good sign that these numbers are stabilizing, but it's still too early to conclude whether or not containment has worked. Criticism continues over China's speed in handling the epidemic. That has Hubei province, the center of the outbreak, removing two health officials from their posts. In Hong Kong, a new case of the virus in a public housing unit is raising questions about the spread of the disease. We get details now from Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann in Hong Kong. They will continue to inspect and disinfect this public housing estate where we found two confirmed cases of the coronavirus. This was a 62-year-old woman who contracted the disease and she lived directly below a man who also tested positive earlier. So there is a 